The opinions expressed by the members of our panel do not necessarily represent that of the station management or ownership. All right, you guys, don't nobody turn your radio dials. You mugs keep it right there on our special March edition of Meet the Chicago Historians. We got to use a lot of top shelf show. It's all about Chicago gangland, featuring lots of stuff about that favorite Chicago hood, Al Capone. Now here's the boss of our mob, John the Electrician DeVita. Well, thank you very much, Rich, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. From the John DeVita Broadcast Center, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another broadcast of Meet the Chicago Historians on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Monday, March the 18th, the year 2013, or 2013. Today's panel will be talking about Al Capone, the rival Chicago gangs, Prohibition area, and today's outfit. So sit back and enjoy Meet the Chicago Historians. And now to start today's broadcast, here's our announcer, Mr. Richard Lang. <laughs> And now let me introduce our panel chairman, that former honor student as in, yes, your honor, and no, your honor, Jack Ryan. Good afternoon. Another beautiful wintry day outside. It's about, what, is it 40 degrees yet, you think? Not is it quite. No. 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 It seems it's like the old summery. winter wants to hang out. It was warmer last month, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I think it was. Anyway, before we get on to our main topic, a lot of few things, a lot of few things. Several things have happened worth making note of. We had an election of a pope, for one. And uh, I don't know, how, how do you think, um, how can they handicap this, say, who would be, might be a favorite? How can they know anything about what goes on there? It's not like, uh, not like the NFL or, you know, horse racing. Well, they said, they said he came in second place last time. Was it? Yeah. He showed. Huh? Yeah, it's sure not like uh, horse racing, huh? Well, I see a lot of those cardinals were touting this guy. Yeah. And uh, I think the odds were... They were touting him? Taunting oh, him. yeah, touting him. Touting him. Oh, he was, he was, huh? Sure. There's, there's an old saying uh, amongst the, uh, the curia that uh, the man who goes into the conclave a pope comes out a cardinal. The favorite, meaning that the, the, the one who's most widely talked about as being the next pope almost never is, in fact, the next mm. pope. It's usually someone unexpected. And this, this man was... Largely you, unexpected. It's kind of like being a Republican presidential candidate. <laughs> well, not quite exactly the same thing. Not quite exactly the same thing. They don't have to participate in debates, for one thing. Well, they, they said that the uh, he was a Jes the first Jesuit that was ever elected or came up to close to being a pope. However, one of the uh, Jesuits said that once he became bishop, he sort of lost his standing as a Jesuit, but his teaching or his uh, learning carried on with him so you could see the way he behaved that he He's was a Jesuit. Right. St. Ignatius was a military man before he was a, before he got the order going, I know that. And I understand that uh, Hitler, Hitler used the Jesuits as a model for some of his military groups like, I mean, you know, organizationally. You know, we, had, we had our guest, your, your friend Bill, right, wasn't father, he's a Jesuit, correct? Yes, on, yes, name? George Lane. Yeah. Um, he's very, very happy. George is very happy that a Jesuit got in, and uh, uh, I, I imagine the whole Jesuit order is happy. I hope so. I know I was happy when John Kennedy got in. I was 14 years old then, though. Yeah. Well, you got to look at, too, that our, uh, bishop, I mean. our bishop here, uh, Bishop George, is happy, too, because his first name is Francis. Yeah, that's right. This is Before we go any f further, let's go around the table here. Uh, Starting with our, our regular panel members, what is your name, sir? And what do you do? My name is. Uh, I'm a private eye, and I heard this tough guy over here to my left introducing the show. So I was under the impression we were going to be talking about law and order. A partner's a partner. When somebody kills your partner, you got to do something about it. This is the stuff that uh, dreams are made of. Anyway, my name, my name is John Escachoco, and I'm very glad to be back after a hiatus of a few months. So I'm glad to be back here at the John DeVita Broadcast Center. 
uh, for Meet the Chicago Historians. And once again, you're a recovering politician, isn't that correct? <laughs> I will never recover from having been a politician. I, I am a card-carrying <laughs> politician, have been for... You can sure for, tell for John is from Cicero. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure how, but uh, if, if you say so. Next case. <laughs> Bill Kugelman here, uh, uh, one of the regulars, and uh, uh, I'll just pass it right along, uh, Rich. I'm your announcer, Rich Lang, and a longtime history buff. I've done some teaching history, <coughs> and for several years a student in Ken Little's Wright College Chicago history class. What do you mean by history buff, uh, uh, Rich? Does that mean that you study history nude? <laughs> in a buff? <laughs> Ooh, that's bad. Oh, that, uh, that's the way the show's going today. <laughs> that's where you get the, the raw truth, right? Yes. Uh, name's Al Opitz. I'm also a student of Ken Little, but this time around I had to go and get a new knee, so I sort of missed the class this time. And I'm Ken Little, and uh, I uh, teach uh, Chicago history at, uh, at Wright College, but I also spent 35 years in the Chicago Fire Department as a senior fire line operator. And you know you're the expert, our expert on streets, correct? Expert, oh, I try to be. Yeah, you know, you know, the minute you get pegged as an expert, somebody shoots an arrow expert, at you. Yeah. <laughs> they try to shoot at you, or, all the time. or a harpoon, they try to or knock something. you down. Yeah. yeah, right. It's like being the top gunfighter, right? That's right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Tom. Uh, Tom Tyler. Uh, I'm a non-income generated employee empl employee right now. Uh, I am a former Vietnam veteran. Uh, worked at WDC back in the '60s. Uh, WGN uh, radio and television in the background in different uh, capacities, and I'm, I'm glad to be here today. Now we have two guest panelists today, and uh, one, one closest to me, Sir Jim Padar. Padar. Padar? <coughs> Padar, okay. And what, in your background, and you what? Yeah, I'm a retired Chicago police officer, uh, worked in Chicago uh, uh, for 29 years. Uh, most of my street time was spent in homicide. Uh, and uh, that's the part. If, if I had to go back to the job, that's the part I would repeat was the 11 years in homicide. Mm. Hard work, but a lot of fun. Not too many repeat victims, right? No, no repeat <laughs> victims. A lot of repeat <laughs> offenders, though. Yeah, well, I wonder why. You know, I've often wondered that. There was a good series at Homicide in Baltimore there. That was one of the most true-to-life mm -hmm. series that I've ever seen uh, on television. But how come, how come they call it Homicide Life on the Street? <laughs> it seems like that's a paradox right there, doesn't it? I think they were referring to the detectives there. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed that very much. I, mean, I was laid up with uh, bad arthritis, and that, that and Law and Order got me through the whole thing. And listening to my, ra my talk radio. Right, yeah. right. Yes, sir. Next up, Don Harrion? Harrion, that's close enough. Okay, yeah. oh, is it good enough? Yeah, I, uh, this is, I'm Joe, the new guy here. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was uh, with the Chicago Police for 38 years and uh, eight years with the Cook County Sheriff. Uh, most of 46 years was spent on organized crime, which uh, I liked it very much. He also wrote a couple of books. They're quite interesting. Yeah, I happen to get involved <laughs> with that a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. Well, well I'll get in here then. They're on sale on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, did you, you wrote too, didn't you? You author? Yeah, I've got a blog going. Uh, I started a couple years ago uh, and kind of blew my mind at the successes. Uh, today we're talking over 72,000 views. It's called On Being a Cop, uh, and it's uh, at uh, onbeingacop.org. Uh, just uh, mostly cop stories, uh, stuff from days of old. And, w and what were your books, Jim? Or, I'm sorry, Don? Uh, Pardon me. The first one was called Pay, Quit, or Die, which uh, was a Chicago mob ultimatum to people involved in illegal activities or whatever. They had to pay a street tax. And the second book was called The Chicago Way, mm -hmm. the way they operate and uh, different things. I was involved in, uh, it's a true crime book, it, it's not fiction, and it's about things I ran into during my career. Okay. There. That we had. That'll, that'll help, help our. You glad you gentlemen could be here today. Well, I notice whenever we had guests in a particular area, we always uh, it always brings the program just up a few notches above what, what it is before. So anyway, uh, from our last time, uh, Bill, you were talking about the play that's based on 
the Our Lady of Angels fire of December 1st, 1958, and what's happened since then? Well, the play is named uh, When when uh, Angels Wept, uh, and it's uh, written and uh, uh, produced, directed by a fellow by the name of Charlie Grippo. Um, it is about the fire where 95 uh, died, three nuns and the rest kids, uh, one of the tragedies of Chicago uh, and of the Chicago Fire Department, of course. And uh, uh, we, I, I've gotten very, very tight with, uh, with uh, the OLA survivors and uh, was kind of, uh, you know, helping Charlie Grippo put this together uh, and and uh, acting as a a go between uh, between the fire department and uh, in this play to make sure that uh, it was done right. Um, he's been he, every show has been sold out. Uh, it's quite a heartbreaker uh, in some uh, areas, but uh, it shows the. Uh, the lacking of any common sense back then and how things were hidden from the public view and uh, uh, he, he does it very well he, uh, he, he pulls no punches and uh, it's uh, Thursday, Friday and Saturday at 8pm Sunday at 3pm at the uh, theater at 3502 North Elston Avenue it's called the Prop Theater uh, and it'll go through until, you know, I, I believe it's April, the middle of April. That's right near Cubs Park, then, correct? Uh, no, not really. No? Not really, no. In Elston <laughs> Avenue over there? Uh, well, it's at Elston and Addison, but uh, yeah, no. way, it's way, way of west of, okay. of it's west Cubs of Park. Okay, west of the river, yeah. so. Yeah. Right, in fact, right it's off to yeah. Kennedy. you got to well, learn where not Chicago's not at. Yeah. Red, you got to learn where Chicago's at. Chicago. <laughs> Chicago. Remember, yeah. you, you said say Chicago. Yeah. Chicago. Please. Remember, you said if you wanted a street, uh, you know, identification. Yeah, what well, happened here. to O'Brien Street? I see it's gone. Oh, it's right. Ratchford. It's Ratchford. Ratchford. Yeah, it's Why named not? after the. Uh, the connection there was it was the. Uh, it looks like an alley. Probably looks like Ratchford. <laughs> Are you finished? <laughs> no. <laughs> it was. Um, the uh, police academy for a while, the old yeah. Foster School, 720 right. West O'Brien. Yes, that's where that's where I uh, went to the police academy, 720 West O'Brien. Yeah. Uh, it, it had been condemned by the Chicago Board of Education, so the police took it over and <laughs> oh, condemned geez. by the Legion of Decency uh, and money. <laughs> <laughs> and they named it for uh, for Commander Rochford. Uh -huh, the street. They, yeah, and it's an official. Yeah. I loved O'Brien Street because it's a throwback to the. Uh, you know, to the Irish that were there, you know, the Learys. Like back in the O'Leary's day and all that. Yeah, right. Well, you'll have to change your T-shirt then, uh, yeah. Jack. Yeah, you got that. Uh, alumnus, yeah. Yeah, you were uh, O'Brien alumnus. O'Brien Street University. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, I the wife was telling me, there's no O'Brien Street. And I, was, I know there is. I'll tell you. I was coming back from Northwestern Hospital. I cut by, you know, to get a Polish sausage over there. Oh, sure. What was there? Rockford Street. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's like uh, the craft building. They, they uh, craft uh, decided to donate to Chicago because it's so bad shape that nobody wanted it anymore, and the police took it over. Yeah, mm. and the city, the city took it over. Yeah. City uh, fire department personnel and it's medical. It's kind of a cheesy there. place to begin with, wasn't it? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> they probably tore it down, though. Anyway. <laughs> so, is anything now uh, our favorite museum? the Fire Museum of Greater Chicago. Is there anything going on over there, Bill? We are uh, in the process of uh, raising money, which <laughs> which is an ongoing 24-7. never ends. Uh, right, Ken? Yeah. And uh, we would like to get the second floor done so that we can move everything in there. And, and we're still looking, if anybody out there knows, of a uh, abandoned or a, a vacant uh, car dealership where we can you know, store all of these vehicles that we have. Uh, that that would be it. But uh, we've got some, uh, we've got a lot of things going in. In fact, I didn't know Ken was going to be here. No. Uh, Bob Kajurian gave me a, a package, I mean a big package, of uh, 
fire department orders from 1900 on, Ken. Wow. Uh, I've got those. I'm going through them now. We try to put something in the newsletter. Yeah, you'll see a lot uh, with your name in there. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, well, you're laughing. It is my name. <laughs> <laughs> my great uncle and my grandfather and, uh, yeah. They're, hey, you they're know what? I don't, just a s sort of a sideline. You know, y y the, your family originally came out of the village of Hyde Park Fire Department. Yes. Yes. Did you know one of them received an award from the village of Hyde Park for I, rescue? Yes, I did. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's the only only uh, r award that they publicized. Too. Sam Sam lived uh, kitty corner from uh, Engine Forty Five. Oh. Okay. When he was when he was there, yeah. and uh, somebody asked me the other day, well, you know, they worked, they were working twenty four on. Yeah. Uh, and and they were never off. No, you know, really. hardly ever, because they all lived next to the firehouse or across the street. Or yeah, or, they were or, allowed to uh, leave for meals, so yes. know, three hours. Yeah. A conjugal yeah. visit now and then, or what? Well, exactly. <laughs> Without the cups. between the lines, yeah. <laughs> oh, whatever. I'm making it right. Yeah, yeah. He, he's, he only comes home uh, once every twelve days, but they got eight kids, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, like sailors. That. Oh. that kind of thing. Oh. Also, see the village of Hyde Park. I was born there. Right really? in the village then, lying in hospital over the university campus. Oh, sure. Oh. There's yeah. a plaque there. Well, the, the atomic energy was, uh, atomic age was born over there. Also. Yeah. Oh, okay. Remember that was, uh, the, what, the Manhattan Project? Or Stag Field. What? Yeah. Stag, Stag, Stag Field. Stag Field. Yeah. Stag Stadium, right. Stag. Amos Alonzo Stag. It's hard to think of University of Chicago as being a football power, but they were a charter member of the Big Ten yeah, and were sure. replaced yeah. by... Michigan State in 1939. So yeah, yeah they decided to get out of, out of the uh, Another it's another sidebar to get yeah. off the off the topics. But uh, well, if you want, there's a uh, dealership at uh, North Northwest Highway in uh, Harlem that's right now vacant. I I've been know. there. I yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I visited there. Uh, you know. uh, there there's a lot of them, but they also want a lot of money too. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. the problem. Yeah, and we we need a. Uh, you know, we need a couple of angels. Yeah, visit your friendly alderman. Yeah. How many uh, vehicles? <laughs> <have> <laughs> a friendly <laughs> alderman? <laughs> There's an oxymoron for you. <laughs> How many vehicles do you have to store? Oh, we've probably got 19. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. And and they aren't, you know, they aren't squads. They, you know, squad cars, they're all hook and ladders and pumpers and so forth. And, and what years do they uh, go from? Kenny, come on and help me. 18. Yeah, we have a 1918 Bulldog Mac, yeah. which I think is the oldest uh, running, uh, running one. apparatus. Yeah. Right. And we have 1930, 1929. Mm. Uh, most of it's vehicles that have been retired, you know, and, the, you know, you got a hook and ladder is 35 feet long. What the hell you do with it, oh you know, God. when you replace yeah. it, you know? You don't have room in the firehouse to get most of these come from uh, from smaller departments, you know. Sure. We just picked up a fire truck uh, within the last couple of months, you know. Some yeah. of these were, were actually made in our repair shops. Is that right? Yeah, the smoke yeah. ejector and that. Yeah. So they're, they're one of a kind. Yeah. And, of course, they, you know, they're not used anymore. I, I give an example. I, I helped restore a 1930 White as a rescue squad. It's the only one in the country. We could not get an evaluation on it because it's unique. There's just nothing, you know. And we have that on exhibit at the yeah, that's on 5218 exhibit. Southwestern. Yeah. Are there any open uh, houses coming up or anything? Yes, we have one coming up. We have two coming up, the 23rd and the 29th. 9th, yeah. 23rd and the 29th. Saturday from 10 to 2. Yeah. And uh, this, month uh, next month. Uh, this month, this month, this month, yeah, we're always uh, the, the fourth Saturday is always oh. our traditional, but uh, the last we've Saturday, been getting yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a lot of uh, donations, and so we're we're slowly putting them, you know, to where it makes sense. You know, you start out with the volunteer fire department, <laughs> and you go into the horse drawn fire department, and and we've got. Um, yeah, we got Christopher Columbus. We got a statue of him. You know, yes, a lot we of do. unique things. Christopher Columbus from the Columbian Exposition. Yeah, and uh, every Italian organization in in the country wants that. Yeah. They ain't getting it. Yeah. They ain't getting it at all. Uh, it's it's quite a it, it's quite a thing. 
Yeah. Quite a thing. We were we were uh, attended the Southside Irish Parade. No. We're, it starts at like 103rd and Western. We're at 52nd and Western. So, and I think we were vehicle number 90 in the parade. Or Out of 90. Out of 90. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't even give us shovels. Yeah. Oh, you had somebody, they did. somebody had to clean the place up. What's green six miles long with a collective IQ of 70? St. Patrick's Day Parade. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Yeah, I'm Irish now. I can and say you that. would say that. I can say I get rid of it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding, folks. After all, now, getting back to the topics we're on, we did have St. Patrick's Day yesterday, yep. only on a Sunday. Of course, the parades were all done by then. I'm busy time of year. Tom McKenna, I'm sure, and Dennis are busy, were busy with the pipes and drums. You know, This is, this is their season. Has been. It seems like St. Patrick's Day is the whole month of March now, doesn't it? You think any of those people are working today? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> sure. yeah, right. It could be. Maybe that's about the end, though. Because tomorrow we got uh, St. Joseph's Day. I see you're wearing red, Bill. That's oh. right. The that's eyes are right. green and yeah. they're bloodshot. So <laughs> green and red. But uh, that is a big saint for Polish and Italian people, am I not correct? Big, big in Italian neighborhoods with the. Uh, uh, St. Joseph's Table? St. Joseph's Table. I grew up in an Italian neighborhood, and they were really very generous. Uh, and everybody was invited, and you could eat as much and as long as you wanted, you know, so. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, I was a kid, you know, I was, you know. A lot of Master Choli? Re reserved. No, you know, you know what I had, to, like, for the first time? Olive oil. Hmm. Rather than butter. Where Home was that? On Sangamon and around No, no, no. Oh. Black Hawk in Cleveland, near North oh, Side. Uh, yeah. yeah. That was about the uh, the uh, the beginning of the Italian neighborhood, and it stretched south from there to, you know, to uh, Cabrini, uh, St. Philip and Easy, um, Chicago, um, Oak in Cleveland. So, yeah, it was all Italian in there. But so. here we are right between those two holidays. And we've declared this to be Al Capone Day. And that's the, that's what they wanted us to talk about. We'll get to the Al, Big Al, also known variously as Snorky, Snorky. Uh, Scarface, Snorky. Al Brown. He managed fighters under the name of Al Brown, I believe. Matter of fact, there were a couple of old-time fighters I used to see when I worked downtown. They'd come down every night. Um, um, Leo Rodak, his son, was a, on the, was a lieutenant on the fire department. He had been, like, world's featherweight champion, 19... 39-41 era, know, know the name? No. Uh, and so he has Frankie Frisco, who was older. He was Italian. And he's telling me the story. He says one time he's he's in this, has a bout, and his, uh, Al Brown wants him to throw the fight. He says, bleep him. I ain't throwing no fight, you know. He said, you know who Al Brown was, don't you, Red? I said, who's that? It was Capone. So he's, but he liked me anyway. <laughs> Some of his stories. So. That was a story I got right from, right from him. But oh. these men are, are gone now, so. Well, I was going to be able to talk to them anyway. So. Al Capone was a good uh, leader in pol politics because he's the first one to start feeding people off the back of a truck with ham. Was it? Ham get beer? the boats. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a starter of all that stuff, yeah. Well, we started out with the Pope. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And now we're <laughs> well, finally oh, on. Th well, that's, that's the topic. Capone. We're still talking topic about we're supposed the to have by proper request, remember? <laughs> we're, we're, we're supposed to go with it. Okay, who wants to start off? Any, any one of our guests, anything to offer about Mr. Capone first off? Or? Not about Capone. Uh, I, I, I was more, uh, when I was growing up, uh, the guy who was in charge in those days was uh, Tony Accardo. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. And uh, I, I do like to tell the story uh, of going to, uh, I was about 16 at the time, and I worked with a kid who, who knew Tony Accardo's daughter, who was our age, and uh, wound up at his place in River Forest at her birthday party one night. Uh, they cleared me on the uh, list, and uh, we went in there, and uh, it was very, very, very posh house, and we had a very, very nice party. Uh, and then uh, when you left the party, you were brought up into the living room, and uh, Mr. Accardo said good night to you. Uh, and it was uh, kind of a spooky experience because of course everyone knew who Tony was but he was uh, he was very much the gentleman he wore a gray suit and a natty tie and had a couple guys sitting on each side of him and uh, so uh, boys huh yeah boys. I can, I can say uh, you know I, I went to Tony Accardo's house for a birthday party but, uh, 
but uh, really never never met the never met the uh, uh, daughter again, and uh, never had any more contact with him. But that was that was my teenage experience. I was about sixteen at the time. Yeah. And where'd you go to school? I went to school at Austin High School, mm -hmm. um, on the west side, uh, and that was a that was a great experience, and uh, I, I did well there. And, uh, and this is Jim talking now. Everybody will recognize the voice. Yeah. yeah. Jim Padar. 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 Yeah. Padar. Okay. And uh, how about Don? Well, let's hear a little bit about the gang. gang well, win. first of all, I d I went to Austin High School as well, wow. and didn't do very well, hmm. so uh, I quit. And then I got wise and went back and finally graduated. And then, then uh, but uh, that we had a, a situation at right across the street from Austin High School with a guy named Roger Tui, oh, yeah. who was a, a he wasn't a mafia guy. He was a mob guy. He, well, he was in his own business. Terrible Tuies, right? Pardon? Out of Des Plaines, I believe there was headquartered. Uh, for a while, yeah. yeah. And uh, actually, he got shot. That's how I met him. Him, him and his uh, bodyguard mm -hmm. were shotgunned uh, coming home one night. Anyway, Al Capone, uh, he was a, a, a thorn in Al Capone's side and because he was also bootlegging on the north side, and Capone wanted everything. And uh, it, it turned out that... Uh, he had him framed for kidnapping of a guy named Jake yeah. Factor, his name was. Yeah. Anyway, who was wanted in England for some kind of fraud. Anyway, he was a, a, a bad guy. Anyway, he claimed he was kidnapped by Roger Tui, and they went to trial, and he got life in prison for this. Yeah, and he got it released. It was all a, a joke. It was he got a released thing. around 1958 because I was in seventh grade, I remember. Okay. And we yeah. also had, oddly enough, we had a new pastor come to the parish. His name was George Tui. Of course, we, re we reasoned that must be a relative. You know, yeah. <laughs> sure. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Before. And didn't Roger go to visit his sister? out maybe not even two weeks or something, wasn't it? That's about three weeks. I think something like that. For 23 days. That's and there's the picture of him laying down, and he said the uh, something to, to the uh, effect of, the illegitimate born people never forget. Mm. I don't remember mm. that. Well, I mean, he, he said it in a different word, you know. You can't say it in a very no, different he word. said the blank never. Dagos never forget. Is that what he said? That's what he said. You can't say that word either. No. And he bled to death. He was really blasted. His, his oh. bodyguard lived, but uh, it was... A bad scene for him. I mean, I felt sorry for yeah. him. Uh, and it came out when he got out of jail. A uh, judge said, "There's no case here. How could you be sent mm -hmm. to jail?" You know, when he was an innocent guy. They made a terrible movie called Roger Tui Gangster, which I guess had nothing, no relation at all to. Uh, oh really? The events. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. But yeah. that was, the real story would make a really great story, uh, picture, with the real, real about the frame up and. Oh really? What yeah. do you think? I don't know. I don't know. Supposedly, they, they said with the Tuies, they knew with all these different chiefs of police in these suburbs, and they would borrow their Tommy guns. <laughs> oh, that, yeah, that's a true story. <laughs> they yeah. would hang them in the office as they're dealing with these uh, different beer people, and one guy walking, boss, this Soto's giving me trouble. Yeah, take that one. <laughs> they walk out like <laughs> putting on a little charade for everybody. Yeah, it was, it was a joke. Uh, yeah. And he conned everybody. They right. thought he had about 100 guys in his gang. Yeah. He had about three. So they're thinking he's going out to take care of them. Yeah, guys, uh, yeah. Uh, somebody hijacked their truck or whatever yeah. and he said, all right, take care of them and, yeah. and these two guys were talking to him in his office. They said, oh my God, let's get out of here and they ran like oh, yeah. the dogs, you know. <laughs> the, uh, you know, getting back to uh, uh, Cardo, uh, and Don should know this, uh, his brother worked at the racetracks with us. His brother was in charge of the Photo, yeah. you know, he was with the photo, uh, uh, the union, and uh, uh, very nice guy, real good guy, you know, clean as a whistle, John, and he lived in uh, uh, right outside of Arlington Heights, in a in a nice section up there, and uh, but with that name and with being the brother of Tony, uh, the G was always on him, always on him. Yeah. 
Okay, well, you're, you're listening to, to Meet the Chicago Historians. We'll be right back. How are the tires on your vehicle? Do you need motor oil, or transmission fluid, or power steering fluid, or antifreeze? What about the wiper blades? Are they in good sharp condition? Is the washer fluid in your tank fill? How good is your battery? Do you need to replace the light bulbs? Well, the place to pick up all these items is at Berkeley Auto Supply at 5237 St. Charles Road in Berkeley, Illinois. Stop in and see Tom, and he will get you any part or supply you might need for your vehicle. Tom at Berkeley Auto Supply has everything you need for your vehicle. He has every tool, parts, and supplies you might need from the front bumper to the rear bumper, from the top of your roof to the bottom of your chassis. You can call Tom at 708-544-8350, and they are located at 5237 St. Charles Road in Berkeley. Tom's hours are Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., Saturdays, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., and on Sundays, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. That's Berkeley Auto Supply at 5237 St. Charles Road, just east of Wolf Road and west of Manheim Road, about two miles south side of the street. Call 708-544-8350 for parts, tools, and supplies. It's Berkeley Auto Supply, 708-544-8350. Now, back to our discussion. Jack? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> now, we're back. We were talking about, where were we now? Uh, L let me finish this. Back and, oh, Tony Carlos. Yeah, Carter, about John. Uh, he uh, is a very nice guy. In fact, my kids went to school with his kids out there and, and uh, in the northwest suburbs. And uh, uh, met John. He, he, we went to the same church, uh, St. Colette's. And... Uh, uh, the, like I say, the G would come in, and it would just be, uh, I, I, you know, I want to say harassment, but it wasn't. They were, you know, just keeping on him because of his name. And and uh, I, I just, you know, they'd call him down. Finally, uh, I, I got a hold of one of the guys from the FBI, and uh, he must have been some type of a boss. And I complained about it, uh, that, that this guy was just, you know, you're 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 harassing this guy. You're you're really, you know, making them feel little. And uh, so they would call then when they were coming out, and I'd have John come down to the office, and you know they question them whatever they were doing in there and that. But but here's a guy that had to live up to that name or live down to that name. Yeah. down to that yeah. name. That's yeah. the thing yeah. that's happening there. Yeah, and John was a nice guy. He died, uh, I don't know, a year or two ago and went out yeah. to the wake, and a and, uh, uh, nice man, nice man. Well, the, the, the feds uh, at different levels have never been known for their... Uh, oh, yeah. TLC. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Their, their yeah. sense of whatever. And they, I know they, they always they look down on the uh, local people, and I found... Like our, the guy we had before, uh, two times ago was commissioner or superintendent of police. I don't think he, could, he couldn't find something with both hands if he tried out there, but he was the, in charge of it here or whatever. But they, and as they say, they always think the local guys are uh, just a gloomy or, or, you know, or just a, 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 a privateer of sorts. Yeah. I always thought it was the other way around. I thought the local guys always hated the FBI. Uh, it, it's a mutual feeling, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mutual admiration society. Yeah. Yeah. How, yeah. Come, how come the FBI, it's a, it's a crime to lie. Tom McKenna said this. Our, he's one of our panel members, not here today. But he said, why is it it's a crime to lie to the FBI, but it's an art form lying to the police? <laughs> you get a little bit of that in the movie The Sting. If you remember where Charles Durning portrays yeah. the, the Joliet police officer yeah. here in Chicago. And he meets who he thinks are the FBI, which we, you later learned that, of course, it's all a setup. But you get that that byplay between the FBI agent and Durning, this, the the dislike between the federal officer and the local. I remember the, the the supposed FBI agent saying, "Don't crack wise with me, Flatfoot." <laughs> yeah. Well, you got to look at the history of the FBI, though. When they first started out, they were basically college kids, and running around uh, not knowing what they're doing. 
when we first started up, there was there was <laughs> that, that a just wasn't way back then. Yeah, the ATF today. Yeah, yeah. Well, 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 yeah. Six guys to me at, in fact, it was at Arlington, and they were all college kids. <laughs> all, there was only one of them that had any any type of of uh, experience street in smarts? Chicago street smarts, yeah, yeah. and that was Dick Mulder, who turned out to be my partner later on. And Dick came from Chicago, and, and had I, uh, did you know him, Don? No, Dick no, Mulder. No. And uh, the first thing that Tom Brown, the boss, said to me, he says, look at this guy. He says, my God, he says, he's, he's all scars and beat up. <laughs> and he was the only guy, the rest of them were all college kids that didn't know one end of the horse from the I, other. I, I happened to work with a few of those guys then. Yeah. I don't know if I can say that. Can you beat things out? Or sure. The well, they, could, they couldn't find a Jap in Tokyo. All right? <laughs> That's another oh, thing okay. you can't say, Don. <laughs> 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 yeah. hmm. uh, it's funny, but uh, yeah. got, you know, well, we're all in favor of higher education. The more you get, the better. But uh, these are those guys you're talking about. They'll tell you how it's supposed to be, and that's yeah. supposed to be it. Yeah. Not how things really are. Yeah, right. So often, a big difference between uh, their perception and reality of things. It wasn't yeah. too long ago that. Uh, uh, I stopped at one of the racetracks, and, and uh, uh, I, I wanted to for something else. And I just happened to run into the guy that was the head of security there. And uh, he introduced himself. I introduced myself, and uh, he gave me his card. And, and I said, oh, well, you know, where are you from? Meaning I thought he was from some police department yeah. somewhere in that oh no he says I uh, uh, he didn't say oh no he says I, uh, I'm i from western Illinois state or something he had a a, uh, a law enforcement degree and, and western that. Illinois University yeah Yeah, and uh, uh, this was where there was an off track betting at this place and uh, that's where I met him and uh, I said, well, you know, I said, you know what? And I'm looking around the whole room. I said, that guy shouldn't be here. That guy shouldn't be here. That guy shouldn't be here. About three or four of them right there. Oh, okay. And he immediately changed the subject. Yeah. yeah. You know, they, they have no, I, I don't know what's going on. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> well, the problem with a lot of college kids, they, they understand the theory but they don't understand the practicality. They have no, they have no experience. No, yeah. no, no street, experience. No street experience. They do that with the MBAs because uh, my boss was going for his degree, and he says, it ain't supposed to happen that way. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't read the book, though, I guess. <laughs> read the wrong book, yeah. Well, focusing maybe a little bit more on Al Capone himself, I think new historical research questions his involvement in the St. Valentine's Day massacre, and I'm wondering what we think about that. Was that done by his lieutenants? Was he out of the picture? To what extent was Al Capone himself involved with is a signature event for a lot of people as far as connecting with well, Capone? There's a guy St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Yeah, was he was in Florida. He certainly didn't pull triggers himself. But right. to what extent did he direct it? Bugs Moran said, only Capone kills like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, Ralph, some raise that, that point. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. There's That's a book right. out that came out a couple years ago by the name of Ig, I think his name Jonathan is. Jonathan... Iger, 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 something like that. Right. He yeah. he claims that what uh, was nothing to do with Capone, but the real police were involved with it. As well, such I, I, I I do know that they uh, they set up our crime lab to test to see if there was police weapons were used to test because there were those because those accusations originally. That was one of the origin of the right. crime lab. Okay, well the other question well, I always got is. Are there any more books written about any other criminal besides Al Capone, uh, volume-wise? Volume-wise? Because you look at uh, there's uh, a, a slew of books out about Capone, and then the next one follow up with Dillinger, and from there on, sort of dies out real quick. Well, you know what? Uh, you know the, the old saying says, whenever you visit a foreign country or wherever you go outside of the United States, it's, when you tell them you're from Chicago, they say, "Oh." 
Capone? Oh, yeah. Capone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, and then it was Michael Jordan, you know, yeah, was, uh, yeah. after that. But uh, I, I've got books here. In fact, the Chicago Crime Commission still sends me hmm. their their books. And this was from, uh, this is the last one from 07. And, and uh, I don't know if you know this, but Frank Nitty's name was not Nitty. Yeah. Who's working right? It was Nitto. Yeah. Yeah. Was yeah. And and he changed it. Uh, uh, and and uh, I just looking through some. Well, of if you're going to change the name, change it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I would right. do. Yeah. He ended up in. Uh, <laughs> Pretty change. Meyer. One Var Daily. Daily. Yeah. You know, I change it. Var <laughs> Daily. Oh. Didn't they just have a change in uh, leadership of uh, the other day? Of uh, the Crime Billing Commission was. Be like retired or something. Yeah, yeah. an ex FBI agent, I think. Well, that's got the job now. Wasn't that uh, the guy that was oh, the, the superintendent? Jody Weiss. Jody Weiss. No, he they got rid of him. Oh, and I then was very oh, maybe it was the guy that was the head of the FBI Chicago office. Was this that is it? recent, yeah. within a uh, few days. Uh, no, yeah. Bill like was about eighty three years old. Oh so. yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how long he can yeah. hang in there. Do I, 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 you know how many employees them. they have, by the way? Who's that? I think they only got about Chicago Crime Commission. How many? Yes. I couldn't begin. One. One? Wow. One. Who's that? Easy she to answered the phone. Easy to make out the payroll, huh? It's, <laughs> wow. No, see, when I went on the job and I always heard the Chicago Crime Commission, I always yeah. assumed there was 500 people out there yeah. watching the courts and uh, judges and police, and and that was not true at all. And then I learned as I went through the job that it got, there were not never 500, there were only a few, uh, 10 mm -hmm. maybe, and they kept track of crimes mainly statistical you know, is that it, what it, was? it was the no. and and recently I did some work for him within the last few years uh kind of undercover things and I got bored and so <laughs> they asked me to do something so I did and and they it, one person <laughs> I I thought there were at least 20 you know <laughs> I remember what Ross Siragusa was the in the 60s. That, remember that name? Well, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's going back to that. He yeah. was the head of it. I don't know what problem it's been since then. I know they did things like they published a report on, like, uh, the Days of Rage yeah. you know, in 69 and hmm. probably on the, the convention well, the year before. But that was it, though. You know, I mean, they they got it from newspapers or reporters yeah. or police reports. That's it. I don't know. They, they had me fooled. I <laughs> so what are you saying? Is this, this another scam? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't. You can believe what you want to yeah. believe. I mean, that's yeah. what they thought. I yeah, think. What do they do? Is what you're saying? Yeah, right? you know, they write know, reports. Uh, yeah, they, they, yeah, they write. Fault. They they make the books up. <laughs> yeah, right. I know they had people from the Chicago Police Detail there. I remember that. A friend of mine worked for me. Bob Cody was with the. Uh, he was detailed there. Yeah. And but the city was paying him. Right, right. And he just went there to bring reports, and uh, yeah. that's it. Yes, yeah, so see, the, the, we got to remember this, everybody. It wasn't uh, familiar. The main, f the, the main thing to do on the police department is get a job where there's absolutely no police function whatsoever <laughs> and weekends off. That's right. Well, you got to remember going back to the uh, St. Valentine's Massacre. Right. Uh, three of the victims it's are buried it's out it's here in the Irving Park Cemetery. The Gusick brothers? Really? You know. Jake Gusick and that, yeah. No, no, not no, Jake. No, no, not, not Jake. The Gusick brothers. The Gusick brothers. Sorry, the Gusick brothers. Yeah. 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 Are buried out here. And then there's, there's three of the members. I forgot who the third one was. Well, my friend Larry, uh, he's an old West, uh, West Sider boy. You know, boy, he, uh, he was over at Jake Gusick's house when he was a kid. Uh, knew the daughter or something. And, yeah. Well, you know, the story goes that why, why they got dressed so nicely is because of the the movies had dressed in suits and everything else. Before that, they looked like a bunch of bums, and yeah. they had to go on imitate the movies. So yeah, it was a case of life imitating art, right? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, they they said that when The Godfather came out, a lot of these wannabes and low-level thugs were going to watch it to see how they were supposed to behave. <laughs> <and talk. laughs> 
Well, the same thing with, uh, 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 what's the name, Robinson, uh, a movie star. Edward G. Edward, Edward G. G. Robinson, Edward yeah. G. G. He, he learned how to talk from the impersonators. <laughs> yeah. Listen, yeah. guys. Yeah. You got to yeah. imitate the art. Oh, yeah. Rat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now they're all, uh, now all of these, the, you know, the mob, you may as well say now, is just the gangs. Wouldn't you? Yeah, but it's, are, it's, I don't think there's too much of a mob left out there. I don't no. think so either, right. no. No, all the little, yeah. uh, little uh, wannabes out there, uh, mostly black well, gangs, are, they're taking over all the problems. And Spanish, and, and uh, you yeah. know, and, and they're, they're just the, the <laughs> neighborhood shepherd. thugs. Yeah. A few Polish uh, gangs out there, too. Mostly imports. The more things change, the more things stay the same. Yeah. 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 Back to our sources. Yeah. Yeah. As they say, exactly. the names are protected, protect the guilty. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody must have seen the uh, Ken Burns uh, Prohibition uh, right. series, yeah. right? I'm Good thinking. series. Yeah. yeah. They, they were saying in there that Capone was different because he wanted publicity. He wanted the, some sort of stardom or something, picture in the papers, yeah. and et cetera. Do you know anything about Little that? Wrigley Field having autographing Gabby Harkness ball. Yeah, he was in the public eye. <laughs> but by the yeah. way, I just uh, st yeah. there's a, a new book out called Law Chicago, and they got oh, a picture yeah. of Gabby uh, Hayes. Uh, Gabby Hart Hayes. Hart Gabby Hayes. Yeah, no. Yeah. Uh, no, it is yeah. Gabby Hartnett. At Comiskey Park. Yeah, because he's got a, he's got a uniform. How Park. goofy <laughs> can you get? <laughs> it's, it's, it's got. A, it's probably a city series. <laughs> no, it was definitely Wrigley Field, I'm sure. No, no, wait a minute. If you look, there's one picture. He's got the traveling jersey on, though. This is Chicago. It's out of Cubs, right? Hmm. Uh, I, I don't know if they were playing uh, City Series that far back. This oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, sure. Yeah. I was going like to say gonna say one of the things, uh, excuse me, Tom, is okay. that I grew up on the near north side and that uh, SMC uh, Cartage uh, building was, you know, at 2122 Clark where the uh, massacre occurred. That building was still there. Mm -hmm. So right. everybody in the neighborhood, you know, knew what had occurred. Wasn't there a movement on to have it declared a historical site? Remember that? That I don't recall. <laughs> but was it really? <laughs> yeah, it, was, yeah. it was torn down and somebody from Canada bought the wall with all the bullet holes in right. it. Yeah. Yeah. And they restored yeah. Up there, and I'm not sure where to, where in Canada. I think is. some of it is yeah. in Vegas too. Could be. Yeah. Yeah, they have some type of a <laughs> memorial. I know the building was always vacant, and it, you know. It was vacant. Okay. Yeah. Well, it, it could clean up the bloodstains. Well, that that uh, wax museum that had been in Old Town, they had a recreation of it, it was a very realistic looking one. <laughs> Do you remember that? Ripley's. Oh, Ripley's. Not Ripley's. This not was that no. Madame Poussin's or something. Oh yeah. Okay. She yeah, looked yeah. Very, you know. No, I don't recall. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, they they moved that out because I guess it wasn't paying anything. <laughs> That's been yeah. gone for 40 years, I suppose, now. Yeah. Yeah, it, but, you know, I think that movie, uh, you know, but the Roger Corman uh, did the movie mm -hmm. at St. Valentine's Day, Day Massacre. Seems to be pretty accurate. Doesn't it? Yeah, I thought yeah. That it was, yeah. too. And they, they made an attempt to... Um, uh, didn't even look like the area there in Clark, didn't it? A little bit. Well, the only thing they <coughs> that particular day, I mean, it was February. They got an uh, open um, deck, uh, double decker bus. We never had an open double decker bus running in February. In oh, Clark, really? Street, <laughs> Clark Street had streetcars, hmm. but um, I didn't remember that. No. Yeah. Blooper, oh yeah. Blooper. And in the buildings. Across the street are still there, you know, where the lookouts were. Yeah. And I've been told that uh, it was more extensive than what even was portrayed in the, in the movie. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of lookouts. There was even a car at the, at the uh, back of the uh, building, you know, in the alley to make sure that they didn't come out the back. They didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't, they didn't have any drones involved, did they? Mm -hmm. they, they weren't <laughs> flying any drones over there. That raises the question of who portrayed Al Capone best in the movies. Do we like Jason Robards Jr. or Ben Gazzara did it once? I wonder who captured him best. I think Steiger played it once. I think you're Rod right. Steiger played yeah, it. Yeah, in the yeah. late 50s, I believe. Yeah, yeah. a movie yeah. called Capone. Right, yeah. right, right. Chino. Right. Neville Brand was on the uh, <laughs> TV the original show. Yeah, the, yeah, uh, yeah, right. It was on Desi Lou Playhouse, the, the part about bagging Capone. And, of course, you had uh, De Niro. And, uh, the oh yes, movie. right. Exactly. Yeah. The brief scene. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which to, to me, I don't know, that's 
<laughs> I mean, you know, Untouchables is one thing. The series went, went far enough. The early ones, the early ones were much closer to at least what was going on. But then they were like, he was begging Tokyo Rose, and he was begging the German American Volkswagen, and he was, you know, it was like everybody. I could believe that. Yeah. Just Ness. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, he was on assignment in New Star York Base. from time right, to time. Yeah. He would be involved with the New York. Oh, yeah, the he had a bigger expense yeah. account than Lieutenant Gerard did in the future. The way <laughs> they did. You but, know, the uh, other thing, too, is that uh, the buildup of, you know, different people from the FBI, um, Melvin Purvis, you know, and yeah. Elliot Ness, you know, oh. and uh, some of the... You well, know, Purvis was Dillinger, right? Yeah, yeah, Purvis was Dillinger, but he 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 got he got, you know, the ire of of Hoover, and they, he he was getting more publicity. I guess. Yeah, right. I so see. they moved him out. Well, El Elliot Ness was not a uh, was ATF. FBI man. What, no, he was, was a treasury. Agent. He was what Snuffy Smith called a revenue. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> treasury agent. Am I right? Yeah, and I don't know how where did how did he end up? Was he the guy that en ended up as a? Who's that? Elliot Ness. He never. They never met. He never met Capone. No, I know, but I mean, what what did he do after? He was in, I think, Cleveland. Or yeah, since he did. He was, he was a police commissioner. Police commissioner, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think he eventually committed suicide or something. No, Purvis. Uh, Purvis was. Purvis was, Purvis was, was, was the guy. Yeah. yeah. I always mix up the two. Yeah. You know, no, and that no, doesn't no. seem to follow. You know, they, they, you know, these are straight, you know, stand-up citizens, and from what I, when we have read, yeah. it would seem that. The characterization of Ness by in the movie of with uh, Kevin Costner was closer to the real thing. It was kind of what they wanted publicity. That was the idea: is get to generate these p headlines. Yeah. Or well, the only problem, anyway. Only problem with that is uh, Hoover wanted more publicity than the rest of them did. Yeah, right. So sure. Consequently, he tried to downplay anybody else. Uh -huh. Yeah, but he wasn't an FBI man. He was a revenue, remember? Uh, yeah, yeah, but still, he didn't Let's care. pay attention. Yeah. yeah, but still, he wanted more publicity than the rest of the... No, you can't do that. <laughs> well, you know what? You, you get right into the politics then. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. the more publicity you show those people that we all learn to hate in Congress... Uh, you get them so that they can give you more money. Well, the idea, too, was uh, Hoover was a great blackmailer. He kept himself in the job until he died. Well, he wiretapped everybody. <laughs> yeah. all the I don't know what he did, but he... Yeah. And nobody knew that. Uh, yeah, no. nobody, he had them all blackmail. He couldn't, they couldn't fire him. No. no. He had him on well, tape with Maryland. See, no one knows for sure. Like, they, they were smearing him by this homosexual stuff before it was fashionable, see? Well, the fact remains, you know, I've, I've always been a defender of Hoover. I mean, for for most for for all of his life, I mean, he was one of the most respected men in this nation. He was oh, he true. was yeah. he was yeah. a heroic figure in this country. He deserves a tremendous amount of credit for what the FBI did wor during World War II. I mean, their success in rounding up the in, the German intelligence network and, uh, and nailing those guys that that came ashore. Uh, he deserves a lot of credit, I think. And he's, no doubt he's about been it. maligned in yeah. recent years. For political reasons, it's politically correct to malign Hoover, but mm. uh, I think I remember talking to an F we had an FBI agent, FBI agent come in, came out to our Kiwanis meeting once, and he said at the time he says that Hoover was still widely respected within the bureau, that uh, that they did not buy the criticism that had been directed against him, and and uh, within the FBI he was still considered a legendary figure, oh, yeah, no. and very much someone to be admired. Hmm. He, he had no law enforcement experience too. He was just an no. organized organization. But the old, the old bureau of the old bureau of investigation, he renamed it the Federal Bureau of Investigation, had been kind of a political dumping ground. It, it had no status. Uh, in, in that movie, the FBI story that uh, that uh, Jimmy Stewart plays in, they get into the early history of the old bureau of investigation, which was. Uh, he had no effectiveness, had very little power, and was was kind of a patronage operation. They were never armed. They were not. They were they were not armed. armed no. 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 They, they and Hoover the turned it into the you know the legendary law enforcement. It's, I mean, it's the most the, probably the best known law enforcement agency in the world, in the world along yeah. with say Scotland Yard. Yeah. Uh, John, what did you think of the most recent movie about Hoover, starring Leonardo DiCaprio? They seem to go fairly well into his strengths and weaknesses. I, I make it a point not to see any movie with Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> really? Yeah, I, There's I, a story I, I right there. I okay. avoid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the only film I've ever... I, I did see the film, the, the Man in the Iron Mask. I did see that film because I love I love historical <laughs> costume drama. The Aviator was pretty good. But no, I have... I, I, yeah, I, was yeah, yeah. That uh, yeah. Titanic, yeah. You see that? Yeah. Titanic yeah. was, was, in, uh, was uh, quite good in the fact that... Uh, hmm. 
the portrayal of the ship and everything else, but the passenger is another story. Or the well, I always like to tell people when I do talks about the <laughs> Titanic that if it had hit the iceberg head on, if they hadn't seen it and it hit it head on, probably the only one who would have died would have been Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> <laughs> on the prow of the ship yeah. with his arms yeah. on spread, so. And his girl. Uh, yeah, uh, she, perhaps. Yeah. Kate Winslet. Yeah. Yeah, well, there would have been no movie then. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. They, yeah. Never, they never showed the sub. <laughs> the, well, the, story, the story goes on with that. There's a couple of uh, people that fell off, quote, fell off a cruise liner, which apparently they were playing uh, DiCaprio on the prow of the ship. <laughs> oh, even oh. since then, yeah. But, you know, going down 10 mm. stories, I don't understand how they survived. Oh, God, jeez. But uh, actually, there was another story beside that. They were playing on the railings and <laughs> they fell off. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you. Uh, those German spies that were landed uh, by a yeah, submarine yeah. in New well, York? Well, I think what, there, there was a German intelligence network in the United States. Oh. The story has always been that within 48 hours of Pearl Harbor, they were all in custody. Hoover had them. They, the FBI had had spotted them all. They were watching them all. And when the war broke out, they just grabbed these guys, which is why... I mean, there, there, were, there were no significant uh, well, instances those, of German those, espionage or, or sabotage. Sure. Those seven United Germans were going to blow yep. up a lot of things, right? Oh, yeah. Well, the shore patrol is the yeah. guy that caught them. Yeah, I'm sad. The, they, they were not apprehended by the The headline FBI. was FBI captured. Yeah, well. yeah, and that didn't stop at that point. And it's going on today. If, yeah. for instance, Joey Lombardo got caught walking down an alley in Elmwood Park, right? You know who Joey Lombardo is? No. You don't? The no. clown? No, I'm not. I'm not, not when, when it comes clown. to the gangland, I'm not, I'm not knowledgeable anyway, about the, the gangland wanted. stuff. He was wanted for okay. months, and he's a murder killer and all so that So who caught stuff. him? Uh, FBI. Really? They actually caught him. But oh. he had an abscess, abscess tooth, I believe, and he was going to visit Spilato's brother, who's the dentist. Oh. Hmm. Spilato's brother, the dentist, hated Lombardo because he thought he was one of the guys that killed his two brothers, Michael mm. and Tony. Mm -hmm. So as soon as he left the office, he called the FBI and said, Joey Lombardo is going to be right over here. So they go out there and grab him. Mm -hmm. FBI captured. I mean, yeah. I get three Boy Scouts that could have. Sure, you know one of the information. It, <laughs> well, information like that. Yeah. I yeah, mean, uh, it depends on the publicity. You know, if you get <coughs> good publicity, and that's, he had it. Hoover had a lot of good publicity. Oh, yeah. You well, never heard of an FBI man robbing a bank, of which they did on occasion, yeah. and got caught. So oh, you never oh, read that. That's a story. No, no, oh, that's yeah, a story. that was well known. Inspector Erskine would be shocked, wouldn't he? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, they they had something going with the press somehow or other. But he did, or he wiretapped the press. I don't know what he did, but yeah. Yeah. he had something going with him. That it? reminds me of the story you wanted me to tell in the air, Ken. You know, it was about the Chinese businessman. He's uh, supposed to go see his Jewish lawyer about some matters, you know. So he takes <coughs> everything. So they go out to lunch. They're having a couple of drinks, and all of a sudden the lawyer turns around and he's boom punches him. Knocks him off the stool. He says, what was that for? He says, you Chinese attacking Pearl Harbor. I'm on side. Did they do it? Did they mix it up already? Yeah, you attacking Pearl Harbor. He says, it wasn't the Chinese, it was the Japanese. It's Japanese, Chinese, Vietnamese. What's the difference? So a while later, the business, the Chinese guy turned around and knocks the lawyer off the stool. He says, what was that for? He says, you Jews sinking the Titanic. He says, the Titanic was sunk by, by an iceberg. He says, iceberg, Greenberg, Goldberg. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 that's bad. Does <laughs> <laughs> that bring us to a break? Yeah. <laughs> hey. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. You've been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians. Please don't turn that dial. Exit Service has changed their name to Carpet Warehouse at 4300 West Montrose Avenue in Chicago and their new location at 440 North Sheridan Road in Highwood, Illinois, called Carpet of Highwood. Stop in at w Carpet Warehouse at 4300 West Montrose, phone number 773-283-0100 or at 440 North Sheridan Road in Highwood. 
Phone number, 847-266-1400. For carpet in your living room, dining room, bedroom, den, or family room, stop in at either location for a great deal. Once again, Carpet Warehouse, 4300 West Montrose Avenue. Phone number, 773-283-0100 in Chicago. Or Carpet of Highwood, 440 North Sheridan Road. Phone number, 847-266-1400. Remember, if you need a carpet for your living room, dining room, bedroom, den, or family room, stop in at 4300 West Montrose Avenue in Chicago. Phone number, 773-283-0100 or at 440 North Sheridan Road in Highwood. Phone number 847-266-1400 for a great deal. Turn you to our discussion. And here is the, the most disgusted person here. <laughs> anyway, well, all right, folks, uh, we've been in uh, a couple of segments so far, so let's reintroduce everybody to re re refresh memories. To my left is Mr. Federal Officers, Nobody Move. The name is Ness, Elliot Ness. In, in March of 1932, Elliot Ness and his untouchables were on the trail of the Frank Nitty gang throughout the city of Chicago. My name is John S. Kachoko, and I'm glad to be back with Meet the Chicago Historians and all my fellow Chicago historians. I'm just Bill Kugelman. <laughs> just plain Bill? Just, just plain Bill. Bill. Rich Lang, your announcer. Al Opitz. Ken Little, stuffing my face. <laughs> Tom Tyler. Don Arian. And Jim Padar. And I hope you gentlemen are enjoying your, your stay today and will come back sometime. We'll try to get as much uh, about your talk about your books in a moment or two. But you're talking about Elliot Ness, but you, uh, the invitation you were doing there, Mr. Koshelko, <laughs> made me think of in the uh, uh, Clinton administration, the head of the F the um, Pure Food Food and Drug Administration, the Pure what is it? The Pure Food FDA or FDA FDA, FDA Food yeah. and Drug Administration. And his name was Kessler, who was a doctor, who was also a lawyer. I think he wanted to be Elliot Ness because one of the companies had uh, orange juice and it said something like "fresh choice" earning from concentrate. He found objection to the wording there, "fresh choice" and "from mm -hmm. concentrate." So do they do they send an opinion to the company? No, they went and I think the plant was in Florida. They went and they seized they they raided the place and pounded the whole whole uh, inventory they had there. Mm. Imagine this is orange juice now. This isn't heroin. This isn't hooch. <laughs> not, that kind of a I think it might be a little overreaching there. <laughs> did that really happen? If you remember, they didn't make much news. But when you listen to certain radio guys, they'll they'll make sure you hear about it. <laughs> Anyway, hmm. is that street justice? Is that what, uh, <laughs> what that would be? Well, it sounds like a... <laughs> it sounds more like a juice story to me. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh you're looking at my book here, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> a juice loan, huh? <laughs> anyway, okay, where do we want to go now? We're talking about uh, the crime syndicate. El Capone. Uh, yeah, he comes on the scene here, and he came... His uncle was what, Johnny Torrio was a... Wasn't his no, uncle, not his uncle. No. He wasn't an uncle. He no. was. Uh, he brought Torrio brought him here to be the enforcer. You know, yeah. yeah, tough guy. And eventually, uh, uh, Calasomo. He took over for Calasimo. Big Jim Calasimo. Calasimo. Yeah. He, he sort of eliminated him so he could come on top of the bosses there. Yeah. Well, the story is that Calasimo didn't see the um, wisdom of bootlegging. Mm. He was in other things, gambling, prostitution. And White slaver? Yeah. Mm. And um, Torrio said, this is the coming thing, you know, Seems with uh, prohibition and all that. So they think Capone killed Coliseum where he got shot and killed. Yeah, wow. there's a fictionalized version in uh, Scarface. Was that Howard Howard Hughes movie of 1932 with um, Paul Muni? Right. He's a fictionalized. He doesn't call him. Doesn't call himself Capone. Well, no, no, no I never, no, never seen that movie. Oh, yeah, it's a good picture. Very brutal yeah. too. Yeah. Paul Muni was an excellent actor. Oh, oh yeah, oh, incredible. Oh, yeah. He was from here too. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's from. But he, uh, he comes and he uh, 
they, they show it's even called the first ward club <laughs> <laughs> and the character would have been like Colosimo gets bumped off over there you know yeah and uh, but anyway uh, so he what happened to Torio did Torio almost get, get almost buy, buy it in a yeah. gun battle or something yeah he, he lived over in the South Shore neighborhood and he and his wife were coming home from shopping and somebody um, uh, met him outside and shot him and, and then he retired or something huh? yeah I was going to say, uh, on that Colosimo, something sort of interesting. Uh, he was married, Big Jim was married, and he fell in love with a, um actress and performer by the name of Dale Winner. Winner? Winner, yeah. Very beautiful girl. And, uh, you know, he had entertainment at his, at his um, restaurant, which was an, a legitimate uh, first-class restaurant. Where Any, was that, do you know? Um, I think it was at 2121 South Wabash. They, they sometimes talk about the Four Deuces, but that was, a, that was a Capone. You know, this was Colosimo. Anyway, he divorces, Colosimo divorces his wife, Victoria, marries Dale Winter, gets bumped off, hmm. and Dale did not inherit any money because the state of Illinois at the time you had to be married uh, one year or more oh, to oh. Hmm. can you imagine that to mm. inherit an estate or or money so who got the money victoria yeah 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 she that, said ha <laughs> yeah yeah ha <laughs> ha as far as i know i don't know but that it's also may be part of it too you know <clears> they, well they it were loose in some things. They were some family things. They were not loose in, you know. Lutheran? Pardon? Did you say Lutheran? No, no, I said loose in, uh, oh, for example, like family. Lawyers are plugged. Yeah. You know, what's so he getting a divorce for? You know, divorce is, is not it's not recognized, you know. And um, so, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, the early days are, uh, they're fascinating and... Uh, uh, I talked. One of my students actually uh, performed at the Colosimo's a restaurant because it continued uh, up until World War II, at least. Mm. Same name. What was the name of it again? I'm sorry. Pardon? Remember what the name of it was? Or? Well, oh, it was. It was. It was still known as Colosimo's. 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 Yeah, he had been killed around what 1921, 22. Yeah, early on there. Yeah, very early on. And hmm. uh, yeah, she. You know what she said? She said, for example, she lived in Oak Park. She said, when she um, she was a, a chorus girl. In fact, hmm. eventually she performed with the Rockettes. Really? She said, yeah. This was Grace Grace Greco. She said when she finished her pr performance, they called a taxi for her and sent her home in a taxi. You know, hmm. said they, everything was first class. You know. But she was only like 16 years old. <laughs> Her mother, oh, okay. mother didn't, you know, hmm. didn't. Uh, but it was experience, you know. And eventually, 16 going on 37. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. She had a couple of uh, uh, boys. One of them was uh, in the police department. He was in 14, yeah. I think, Officer Greco. But uh, yeah, she could tell uh, all kinds of stories, you know, from from a. Entertainers. Uh, yeah, but that, yeah. that, that poses an interesting question. No matter where you go, it seemed like the hoodlums were always wrapped up with the entertainment industry. Oh. Is, is that because it? I don't know. Is it? Hmm. I thought know, they any, still any, were. Any thoughts on that? Uh? Me, uh, <laughs> well, I, I remember the Villa Venice. You remember? Sure. Yeah. Place yeah. was in Wheeling, oh. was it Avenue. Avenue. Villa Venice. Oh yeah. yeah we were out there yeah. for our prom. Built yeah. by uh, Gian Carmen. Yeah. Oh, and it had uh, right by the, uh, the the Plains River. Yeah. And they had gondolas and yeah. people would wear tuxedos and evening gowns. It was a high class restaurant. Actually, Al Gower's, I think, is there now. It's yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Right. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and then they would uh, drive you to a Quonset hut they had. Where they had roulette and dice games and big <laughs> gambling operation, which no law enforcement agency found or knew about or whatever, because it went on for a few years. And <laughs> then there was an arson 
Uh, well, not an arch. There was a fire that burned to the ground in, uh, we call it uh, accidental or whatever. The fire department said it says uh, arson, I believe. Undetermined? Yeah, uh, that's a better word. <laughs> yeah. Undetermined. So many restaurant fires. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that's going back. Green I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. But they had the rat pack there with Sinatra oh, yeah. and, yeah. and, sorry, and yeah. Dean Martin and Sammy Davis, and they were there for a week or two. Yeah. And, well, yeah. they claimed that that's a payback to Giancana for his help in getting Kennedy elected president. Yeah. Hmm. I don't, that's a story. Well, yeah. Well. I remember uh, as a kid, uh, up around Montrose and Narragansett, there used to be a nightclub. I was with Mist. Yeah, Mist. Yeah, and, yeah. and they had a heck of a fire or something going on. Yeah, the yeah I think the Right, and I remember Sheriff Ogilvy was there, and I was just a kid, and it's wow, the sheriff's here. You know, <laughs> yeah. big deal about it. Yeah, you know. right. where, where was this? It was on uh, uh, Montrose, just off of Narragansett. Yeah, Chicago Reach Center. Yeah, yeah, it was right across the street from there. It was only open maybe six months before it burned down. Big gambling joint. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, yeah I don't So they call it uh, Howard Heights, Howard Heights. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 that was a pretty wide open town, and then a uh, new mayor came in there. He was a reform mayor, closed a lot of it down. Mm. And it was yeah. really whole Milwaukee Avenue was uh, was uh, uh, you know wide open yeah, from what? from Niles, uh, you know, slot Blazes, slot, oh yeah, yeah, all the way out. To, yeah, the roadhouse to, to the village. Yeah, yeah. yeah. River Road had quite a few yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mannheim. Yeah. There's an old story about the two fellows that are sitting on the beach in, in Miami, you know, one of the luxury hotels. <coughs> sitting in the, every, every day they take the same place and finally they strike up a conversation. And the first says, you know, what's your background? How, what, what brings you down here to Florida? He's all, he's, I had a restaurant, I had a big restaurant, but it burned down. And, you know, I got a big insurance settlement, so here I am. He said, what about you? He's, well, it's kind of similar. He's, I, I had a restaurant. Uh, on the East Coast, but we had a terrific flood, destroyed the restaurant, and I collected the insurance, and <coughs> so here I am. So the first guy s sits there thinking for a while, scratches his head, he says, he's, yeah, maybe you can answer a question for me. How do you start a flood? <laughs> That's a good one. Okay, yeah. That's all right. You know what the twist on that is, is that you want hurricane uh, coverage? How do you start a hurricane? <laughs> same, well, same concept. Yeah, yeah there was another, another restaurant down the street from the mist. It was called uh, Wagon Wheel, a real nice restaurant. And I'm not sure why, but they sold out, and then it came to a... Uh, Italian place of sorts, and it went down the tooth real quick. Mm -hmm. And the understanding I had, there was some shenanigans going on in there. I think one day it burned down, if I remember there right. There a lot of gambling. Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah. Casino type. Yeah, I, I didn't, never went into the place because I never cared for it, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, I know I went to the wagon wheel every time I went out with a girl. <laughs> Seemed like yeah, next week we broke up. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, where the hell is this guy taking me? <laughs> but the Wagon Wheel was a pretty nice place. You know, yeah. it was a good, good eatery. Yeah. Yeah. I can remember a place on the south side that was uh, allegedly now, nothing firsthand now, yeah. was a bookie place and whatever for years and years. And they got raided by the intelligence, <laughs> the intelligence division. So the story came Sorry. out that this was, uh, they uncovered this wire room that was connected to a black power organization. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, the oh, papers. So oh, some of these paper guys, they go right along with the BS all the time. Well, I mean, look at, Make, when they really were challenged daily or challenged this guy now either, right? You know, when we were okay. growing up, we didn't, we didn't really notice it because we didn't know any different. But then as you got older... All of your little candy stores and right. and places that tobacco stores, that tobacco, yeah, yeah, they mm -hmm. all had. Oh. Uh, sure, yeah. every one of them yeah. uh, to survive, they must uh, have. Yeah, been doing yeah. Doing that's why they're there. The yeah. Yeah. yeah, the place of 63rd and actually had the same junk in the window for 30 years. I bet. There was a little, uh, little uh, space uh, where you got the electric to warm up your uh, coffee or whatever. Those yeah. plug-in that was in the window. And <laughs> matter of fact, when I was about in second grade, my sister was four years older. We pooled our money because we wanted to get our dad a good uh, Father's Day present. So. I don't know what we had, probably four or five hours. So we're looking, oh, look in the window. We get, oh, this knife, this will be nice for his uh, toolbox. So we bought him a knife. It was a push button. 
they were going to be sold and open. <laughs> but I guess they were open then. You know, it was right there. Yeah. He says, look what they got me, a toad stabber, my dad says, you know. <laughs> but uh, we, you know, we started to be good with his, uh, his uh, tool, toolbox. Well, that reminds me of a story about spies. Uh, my son w was uh, graduating basic from the Air Force, and we went down there to see the graduation. And there was a plane there that they called the XC-99, which was a passenger version of the B-36, so it was a pretty good-sized cool. plane. Oh, wow. God. And I wanted to go back and see it, so I went back there, and I was talking to the guys for a while. I said, do you ever have any spies around? He said, oh, yeah. He says, one time there was a station wagon kept on pulling up here all the time and sat there for hours and then pulled away. And they sort of got suspicious, so they called the FBI. And they came around. They had a young kid there and went out law like he's mowing the lawn. He went and looked inside the station wagon. The guy had all kinds of radio equipment. <laughs> he was a <laughs> retired colonel from the Air Force, so they arrested, <laughs> they arrested him. <laughs> sort of stupid and funny at the same time. It, 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 I was going to say, it reminds me of a joke where um, uh, during the war when phones were very, very um, impossible to get and people had uh, <coughs> basically a party line, you know. Oh, so right. anyway, so the story goes that uh, uh, some German spy comes over, you know, and he, uh, he gets a number from uh, the candy store. If you call the candy store, the lady would, you know, so she she would contact her, you know, she'd holler upstairs or something like that. So anyway, this guy calls up and he says, I want to talk to John. She says, well, we got three Johns here. You know, we got John, the truck driver. We got J John, you know, works in the store. And then we got John, the spy. Which, which, <laughs> <laughs> which, which one do you want to talk to? <laughs> But you know that's that that story with the Chicago uh, connection with with the uh, the uh, the German uh, um, uh, spy and uh, he uh, supposedly came over here on a submarine and somebody mentioned about the FBI was some sort of a, a young uh, lad who was. Patrolling the beach or something. Yeah. And he he spotted a guy and he was really no, doing, he was really like doing back here or something. He said uh, he, he was he was uh, like a teenager, uh, uh, Don. He wasn't even see, uh, a teenager. Well, yeah, now. yeah. Well, he was just you know, and he happened to see the submarine. He was the only one that saw it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he called the FBI, and right. then they traced him, and then uh, one of them got to Chicago. Right. Or was a uh, different in. His family uh, was living around Dickens and Fremont, you know, German neighborhood, and uh, he was going to he was going to blow up uh, a couple of different places, Victor uh, Comptometer, and you know they were making the um, Norden bomb site, you know, and then uh, the optical company, and I can't think of the name of it, Simpson or something like that. They were in Chicago. There was there was a, a rail a couple of railroad uh, uh, tunnels and things on the on the. Uh, in the east, that, that were targets. That they yeah. thought were bo you know bottlenecks would have yeah. tied up the transportation system. Yeah, he and he got caught, and he got he, and he w he was shot right away. <laughs> and then after the war, I understand his parents were deported, and so uh, that was also in our neighborhood. You know, so these little things were. Nice you neighborhood. Know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also I talked to an old timer. He mentioned World War One uh, and. Uh, the Bund, et cetera, and they were very active in the uh, Lake, oh, Lake, yeah. Lake View neighborhood, Belmont and Ashland, you know, so. Well, that, was, that was a completely different story, though, because a lot of Germans were anti-Nazi, oh, yeah. where at the First World War was basically a war between uh, the King of England versus the Kaiser of Germany, and they were cousins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. Oh, they were really the Queen Victoria. Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the, sure. Yeah, and, everybody uh, was. I, I don't know what the conflict was. I think it was something about uh, 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 tra trade, world trade, or something like that. And uh, well, there was a, uh, a lot of sentiment in the U.S. of A. to come in the war on the side of Germany. Because you had a lot of Irish immigrants here, descent, and a lot of Germans. Yeah. I mean, it's not like uh, the Tsar well, wasn't, a, wasn't like, uh, like Nazism going on there. Anything. It wouldn't have made a hell of a lot of difference to the states if I Germany won or England won, you know, realistically. Hmm. But the, the problem was that the uh, 
Habsburg Empire created problems, which Austria, mm -hmm. Austria Hungary, and that was really uh, related but not completely uh, integrated with Germany and uh, uh, England, where uh, the allies of the opposition of Habsburgs were, uh, what was the, uh, I forgot what uh, what their allies were, and they, yeah. they sort of combined the wars after a while, and it ended up being uh, Germany, which included the Austria. triple alliance, the triple yeah. entente. I, the yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't. There was never any, there was never any significant sentiment, even amongst the Irish and Germans, t for America to come into the war on the side of Germany. That there, there was, they basically didn't want us coming into the war on the side of England. But uh, but there was there was I'm not aware that there was ever any pro-war sentiment which wanted the United States to intervene on behalf of, of Germany, and once the war began, there was there was no significant uh, no significant opposition to it even from you know Irish Americans or German Americans, uh, because of because of the the, the run-up to the war, the Germans had made a number of, of serious mistakes that antagonized the United States. Oh virtually drove us into declaring war. And, I, and I'm not a big admirer of Woodrow Wilson, but, uh, but I, 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 just, I just wanted to add that. I, I, hmm. there was, there was, there, but, but what you said was true. German-Americans in the First World War, the relationship with Germany was very different from what it was in the 30s because so many German-Americans had no stomach whatsoever for Adolf Hitler. Right. I'm saying the overwhelming majority had no stomach for Adolf Hitler. Many Italian Americans were not admirers of Mussolini, so there really wasn't that. There, there was no uh, no feeling here uh, of of loyalty to to the old country. I, I love. There's a story that they they tell on one of those remembering Chicago uh, programs about an, an American flyer that was shot down uh, by the Germans during World War II, and his name was something like Hoffelmeyer or Hofberger, and the SS officer who's interrogating him says, "Oh, you are German." And he says, no, I'm an American. Mm. And the SS says, yeah, but your family was German. He says, yes, and they had the good sense to leave this rotten <laughs> country and move to the United States. Yeah, but their relatives were stuck. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, I know the backlash in, uh, against Germans in, in Chicago in World War I was... Uh, no. You know, they changed street names. Yeah. They had oh, yes. to change oh, yeah. names yeah, of hospitals, sister. hotels. Mm. Sauerkraut became Liberty Cabbage. <laughs> and <laughs> Dachshunds became Liberty Hounds. Uh -oh. <laughs> Bismarck, you know, the Bismarcks became Pershings. Oh, is that right? That's yeah, yeah. a good point. Yeah, Bismarcks my, uh, became my Pershings. My sister, one summer in school, she, had a, she worked for a great American insurance company, which had been German-American insurance company until right. the First World War. I do know that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was the same thing with the uh, transportation company, GATX, was German uh, uh, American transportation or something like oh, that. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. 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 And they changed the name too. The other one was Grant Hospital. Yeah. Was also changed. This is where I was born. Yeah. It yeah. was. What was it? German. Yeah, German American. German yeah. Lutheran. German so, deaconess. And yeah. They, yeah. yeah. But, so Kaiser Hof Hotel downtown right, became the Victoria. Right. <laughs> and you know, Pershing himself, his family was German. Were they? Yeah. The per everybody knows that Eisenhower, his family oh, was German, but sure. Pershing, was. Pershing's original name was Fersing. Right. Really? And the, the family changed the name to Pershing when they came to. Yeah. German Swiss. Eisenhower. Me. You too, right? Me. Yeah. 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 My mother said that uh, uh, she went, she was going with a. Uh, uh, a German who uh, was from that neighborhood, Lincoln and uh, Lawrence, and that which was all German at that time. And uh, she said that when the First World War broke out, that uh, uh, this guy came back and and uh, he he was a Nazi, and uh, he just you know he got deported. He says otherwise you'd liable to have been his son. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. But. Uh, you still go around there. You still see remnants of uh, of some of the German uh, heritage around that area, uh, the Lakeview area. Bra yes. Brauhaus. I was just over there a week ago. Right, and, and that, but uh, they're all turning into uh, taco places now. <laughs> you, know, you just can't get away from it. Yeah, yeah. gentrification. The old yeah. You know, the, to get back, there. you're talking about Jean Khan. I had my daughter. Uh, it was a few years back at uh, a place in, uh, I think we were in Schomburg, 
and it was like a Sears uh, uh, store, so, something related to Sears with building stuff. And uh, I happened to go by the the one uh, uh, area where where there was a lady behind the bar, or not behind the bar, behind the uh, counter, and she was uh, she was working there. And I happened to go by, and I recognized her, and I said, uh, "Hey, Vicky, how are you?" I, you know, go by, and Beth said, uh, "She says uh, you know her, Dad." And I said, uh, "Yeah, that's uh, Sam Jean Connor's daughter, Ooh. Vicky, oh. the one that wrote the book, and and oh, that. Yeah. Oh. Here, here she is. She's working for Sears. Yeah. 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 What was yeah. her book? I forgot. Yeah. I don't remember what it is now. It, the daughter. Daughter of yeah. The, yeah, yeah. Something yeah. about my family or the daughter of. Yeah. It's just like. Uh, uh, she used to come to the track. Yeah. Capone's daughter just wrote a book too, not long ago, about yeah. uh, Capone. Uh, there yeah. was a. Um, there was a story about your granddaughter. Yeah. That sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. just yeah. had a son, I think, and. Uh, yeah. Um, there was a story floating around that uh, Al Capone's son had attended my alma mater, St. Rita. I've never seen it verified, you know, in print or anything anywhere. So, if anybody out there knows, please let us know here. Yeah. You yeah. know, there's a, there's a, uh, I guess a, a van you'd call it, uh, and it uh, every time I see it, it's got, it doesn't have emergency light, but it's got a lot of lights on it, you know, yellow and green and blue and purple, and uh, I, I always think that it's the 511 Canteen <laughs> truck. When you know when you're coming into it, and it's not when you get up to it, it says Capone, Capone. There's oh, some the restaurant business restaurant. Yeah, yeah Capone. It's, it's right on Irving Park here. Is it? Yes, really? it is. Oh, it yeah. used to be on Harlem Avenue. And they closed that place and moved right. over here. It's like almost. Uh, so this must be the delivery truck or something. But it looks just like one of the 511 rigs. Yeah, here, I know. You know I, I an know. Emergency. Huh. I know the father, one of the guys that owns the place, and the name is Lambert. So how the hell Capone got in there, I don't know. But well, they call it, I think Capone, which is Capone's yeah. original name. Yeah. Yeah. Capone. Is that is that the place on Harlem? It's a it restaurant. There was one. Used to be on Harlem. Yeah, it used to be, oh, used to be Arthur Creatures Fish and Chips. Right. It's not oh, far from where I go back. I guess on the way home. I knew yeah, a man I when, when I was yeah. when I was in our, our Kiwanis Club uh, in town. And uh, there were there were three three members of our club who were all uh, born around the turn of the century. These were all men that were probably born before 1900 or or around 1900. One of them had a had a number of uh, flower shops in the western suburbs, and he remembered when he was very young. He remembered Capone coming in and buying flowers, buying these, you know, like the movies always show these yeah. big floral displays right. that yeah. they would do when the gangsters would bump each other off. And he rem he remembered him coming in and buying virtually everything in the shop for one of these uh, gangland uh, funerals. Yeah. yeah. So. Oh, yeah. Cicero was notorious for a hangout for Capone, too. Well, his places were not only in Cicero. His, he, had, he had locations elsewhere. So yeah, I know, but Cicero. that was one of the hideouts he had. We gotta water it down, huh, Jen? Yeah. <laughs> I, I was like, I was. I got a little saying because I, I do Cicero history. You know, Capone grew up in New York City. Yeah. He lived in Chicago. He vacationed at government expense for a time in a little island off the coast of San Francisco. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And he died in Florida. Yeah. Yeah. So there are a lot of other communities around this country that have a claim on him as a, as a native They claim son. him. Yeah. You don't want to claim him, though. <laughs> Remember that, uh, how many years ago is this now? 1520, it's got to be. They had that Big Al's place or something on North uh, Dearborn or State Street. They have like a museum. Yeah. And Richard, uh, Richard M. didn't like that being here. Or yeah. yeah, there was something. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was Traffic it, World it or something. It was like else. at uh, Ohio and... Uh, right. Dearborn, oh, Dearborn or, maybe, or Clark, or or Clark. Or, yeah. yeah. Oh, there's a place out it here. It only lasted for about a year. Right. Right. Schiller yeah. Park had a place like that, too, for a while. I forgot what it was. Right off of uh, hmm. River Road. I don't remember what the name of the place was. I never got there. Was this like a separate club place or what? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I, 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 I know what you're talking about. I can't remember either. They well, opened uh, a mob place in Vegas. It's a mob museum. museum. Yeah. Yeah. A friend yeah. of mine just went out there, and he was he's an IRS guy, and... Uh, he was with Frank Collada. You know yeah. who Frank Collada is? I was one of my uh, I graduated grade school with Frank Collada. Okay. 
We once again have to interrupt the proceedings for some messages of interest and importance. friends spring is just around the corner now is the time to think about your roof siding and gutters on your home or place of business we can get some heavy rainstorms in the next few months so be sure the roof siding and gutters are in good shape you don't want the mold or mildew in your attic or crawl space or drip 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 on your ceilings in your rooms or have your walls damaged by a leaky gutter or a bad siding so don't have double expense sooner or later you're going to have to get them repaired so call Besh Brothers Roofing, Siding, and Gutters at 630-616-1359. Mike Besh will drive over in his shiny red truck with ladders on top and Besh Brothers Roofing, Signs on the doors. Mike will look over your roof, siding, and gutters, give you an estimate, and go from there. So don't have double expense. Call Besh Brothers Roofing for a free estimate at 630-616-1359. That's Besh Brothers Roofing, Siding, and Gutters at 630 616 one three five nine. Call today. Six three zero six one six one three five nine. Back to our historians. Yeah, we're back. That's we're back, nice history, enough. history, so history. Smart. It never ends, does it? It keeps on, <laughs> as it says on the history show, made fresh every day. <laughs> and uh, we're getting back to the gangs. And we're talking about gambling before. And uh, we know, of course, that um, there's never and there's no gambling otherwise in this legal stuff. But you got to wonder sometimes, uh, isn't, isn't uh, for example, you go to the, to the U.K. or Ireland, aren't there some things called turf agents right in the corner? Hmm. You can go sure. play horse. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can, it's legal. Yeah. yeah. They also, that was a uh, uh, lacrosse game one time, and they're throwing balls back and forth with bets on it. Where's this? That was a lacrosse game, I think it was. Hmm. In where? Uh, Europe. I forgot. Yeah. And they were, you know, just throwing balls back and forth and placing bets. Yeah. So what's the big deal? I don't know. Yeah. 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 Europe is quite open with their betting. Yeah. 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 Well, I think my, my own personal theory is, you got to cut out an awful lot of graft. Because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, this stuff is going on. Some people way high up are partnering up with them somehow or other. They had, uh, in, in fact, it was the Irish bookies that had uh, a lot of different odds on the Pope. On this Pope selection. Uh, uh, oh yeah, they That's had they had bets on how long it's going to last. Yeah, oh, no. how long it, who's going to be? The and odds and all the cardinals. Yeah, right. every, every cardinal. Yeah. There, there were odds on, on yeah. every yeah. one of the 115 yeah. cardinals. Yeah. They would give you odds. Yeah. Yeah. How can they determine that? Don't you and they were Irish too. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's perfect. <laughs> I remember, if you didn't have casinos, where would Sean Connery get to say, "My name is Ball"? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Ball. That's right. That's right, but. Uh, well, what do, you, what do you think? If, 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 like we have gambling in Illinois. Now we got gambling. Okay. Now, well, the way they do it with the selection, I mean, they must they must be encouraging favoritism, if not out and out corruption. Who's going to get the next casino? No, that's the only thing we should oh, stop. No, no. If, I mean, if, we, if we wanted to get together and open a place, the only thing we should stop is our do we have the cash? Do we have enough for whatever insurance you have to have? Yeah. Uh, zoning, right? right? We should have an open Agreed. place. And if it doesn't make it, it's gone. The that's market right. will take care of it. Yeah. Right. You were talking yeah, about no. Sean Connery early with that casino. I was down in Monaco, and it cost you fifteen dollars to go into casinos just to look oh, around. Sure, sure. Yeah. It's like like the Grand Hotel. You have to yeah. pay just to, to walk around and yeah. look at it. No, I, yeah. I agree with you, Jack. It it should be open and uh, yeah. And, uh, People yeah, the again, casino huh? all over. The, the outfit was running a big dice game. Yeah, all over the place. Oh, remember, <laughs> remember, remember, uh, Pegasus. The, ho the bet delivery service. I was there, and we locked them up the first day they opened. <laughs> yeah, and then they what? They had a court order to keep them open for a while. Or <coughs> well, a guy named uh, Judge Shields. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, first of all, they, 
they called up our office at Maxwell Street and said, uh, we're opening up a, a, a messenger service. Now, what do they call it? Messenger yeah, service. Delivery or something. A messenger, yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, we're taking horse pets already. So we went over there, and uh, it was jammed. It was on Dearborn Street near... Uh, right near Grand, wasn't there somewhere? Pardon? Right close to Grand Avenue, or...? No. No? No, near Van Buren. Oh, down there, okay. And uh, it was jammed with people, and they were taking bets, but they would charge you 10 cents and a dollar for every bet you would make. Mm. Yeah. And then they would give you a receipt. You'd give them whoever you wanted to play, but it only had to be a local racetrack. Mm -hmm. If Maywood was open, they, you could take bets on that. And then the Sportsman at the time was open. So they would take the bets according to what their plan was. And after you give them your $2.20 on a $2 bet, they would have a messenger go to the racetrack lay it down there. and lay it in the windows. Certain windows were set aside mm -hmm. for there are people that come out there and make the bets. They would get the ticket, bring it back to the office. And I said, now what's illegal about that? I said, I don't know if I'm going to find something. <laughs> so, and they went on for a long time, and then others opened up. Before mm -hmm. you knew it, we had like 300 of them all over. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we busted every one of them more than once. And then a judge, I don't want to mention his name, said, uh, if you bust them once, that's enough, otherwise you're going to... You know, it's called harassment, you know, and uh, this and that. So what we would do, we would go out and bust eight of them in one day. We would, I'd have a guy sit in front of uh, the place, walk in about ten minutes before post time, make a $2 bet. Now there's no way the guy can get from in there mm -hmm. to the racetrack. Right. So at ten minutes later, we'd go and arrest him for gambling. You know, well, mm -hmm. that went on and on and on. <laughs> And it was the biggest money-making operation they ever had in their entire life, the outfit I'm talking about. And they told me that. This is the biggest thing we ever had going. Was that and the distinction, that if they delivered it, it was legal, but if they phoned no, it, it was illegal? No, we didn't or? care. Oh, well, yeah, okay. So the judge was putting this case off before... Uh, he'd make a decision on it. It was kind of uh, like a new, new area, wasn't it? There had been tried before? Or? Yeah, right. It lasted a couple of years. I remember, yeah. And this was 79 around there? Well, maybe? Can you imagine now, now with, with you know, Don's era, my era, now with with texting and and, mm -hmm. and uh, phones so and, not a call and, and all of this stuff and, uh, you know, my God, how are you going to stop it? You can't. You, you can't. can't. You know, you just can't. I get when we were there, they were with flags outside and big numbers that they'd hold up and and well, if they every if, phone booth around there, you had to watch. Yeah, if they had big bets, somebody put down a hundred dollars on a horse at three to one or whatever, they'd have to make a big payout. They would have a guy like by Maywood standing by a payphone, hmm. and they would call them and they would lay it off in the track. Legit, because they didn't want to get hurt, right. you know. So, but the smaller bets, they they just kept them and made twenty cents on a two dollar bet, you know. And so the whole thing, it was crazy. It was they had different yeah. names, and then we had the poor old man pa would come in there. They oh, this is the way to do it. Let's do that. Well, they went broke right away, and then the outfit took took their place over. So it was all run by the mob, and they they made. They told me this is the biggest money maker we've ever had, the biggest. When we closed them up, finally some judge said, "Okay, it is illegal," and then they went into uh, what the heck was it? There's so many things. They went into uh, I'm not sure it was uh, uh, poker machines. Uh huh. And they had hundreds of poker machines which is illegal to have. You can have a poker machine. They're illegal. Hmm. Uh, but the only reason they're illegal if the bartender or whatever pays, pays off. Pay yeah. But you have to catch them yeah. paying off or you can't take them. So we start busting those joints. And then we take out five of them in a grill 
four hours later, they got five more back in there. <laughs> so I, I got crazy with that, and I said, okay, I, I had a guy sit in the grill after we left. Who was your rank then? Uh, pardon? Who was your the rank? Sergeant. The sergeant. And, and then uh, he would watch them pay off because they figured we'd never be back again, <laughs> and, and we'd be back that afternoon. Yeah, it, no, they never expected that. Finally, we we did uh, hurt them, and and a lot of stores and taverns got closed up. And but then the mob, I heard in the suburbs, they were uh, they just went to jail for that guy named Marcello, I believe it was, and his brother, and Jimmy. they all went to uh, jail for in Melrose or Stone Park, or they were paying off somebody and. The whole thing, it was crazy. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, Stone Park yeah. was notorious for that. We used to go to Stone Park after hours because the bars were all open. For after yeah, Park. I mean, it was crazy. It, 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 so I, they went from one thing to another, but they always made money with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it, then they, they went by the wayside and we had OTBs? <laughs> Off-track betting yeah. partners come along? That was kind of... Uh, that to the, that Spilatro yeah. had a lot of those. Yeah. And, 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 uh, it was like bingo. You know, it's supposed to have been... And remember, back in the early well, 50s, some of us heard of the slot machine, all the raids for the slot machines. That was probably mob control, too. Yeah, Another way of making money. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The guys used to come but in they're the they're illegal office. to have. They're illegal. Yeah. It's not like a video poker machine. Okay. Got they're it. strictly right. illegal. You got one, you're going to jail. Oh. They're supposed to go to jail. Yeah. I was, the uh, guys would come into the office and say, hey, Bill, he says, come on, your favorite gambler is out there. <laughs> and I'd go walk, and I knew right away what they were talking about. Here's Ma and Pa, or a couple of guys, and they got a Ouija board. <laughs> and they're gambling. Yeah. Remember that? Uh, yeah. oh They'd be sitting there, and, and that's, how, that's how they would bet, yeah. on, uh, on a Ouija board. <laughs> there was a drugstore on, uh, on Belmont and Oak Park, and they had three uh, video poker machines in there. Those things were always busy. Hey, I walk in there any time. There's three people and there's people waiting yeah. in line to get yeah. in there. Sure, yeah. they pay off their all their utilities with that. Yeah. It's human it's nature. We can't fight that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the well, big thing a, today is it, it, they're going to do it again. I know they're going to do it again. You can have them legally now. Let's say you own a grill mm -hmm. and you're going to buy three poker machines. You can have up to five, I believe, legally now. And... Mm -hmm. They're going to be registered with the state, and they're going to deduct whatever payment goes in the machines and payouts and all that. All be legit. But then let's say you put two more in of your own. Yeah. Well, who's going to go around there and check them? Yeah. No one. There is nobody. They don't have anybody. There's mm -hmm. nobody. There's no budget to take care of this stuff. So they'll have. I'd have five, you know, yeah. Yeah. and that's what they're going to do. I know it. And, and they're gonna. You're, they th all these suburbs think they're gonna make a fortune from these things. I, I had a work with a guy. He had uh, uh, playing machines. You know, all these uh, not poker machines, but uh, pinball, pinball, and all those other machines. Mm -hmm. And he'd come to work on, a, on Monday morning with a roll, probably about <laughs> two inches in <laughs> diameter, of dollar bills. Wow. He had a, I think he had well, some more, sometimes two of those. And they're not all dollar bills either, you know. He had two or three thousand dollars in well, his pocket, no problem whatsoever. That's the thing that gets me is, you know, my kids occasionally go to Indiana to, to gamble, you know, or where is it, up in Galena or someplace like that. Why we don't have a, you know, some sort of a casino in Chicago. I know that there, there would be probably problems with it, but... People are going to gamble. We've seen it, you know, yeah. with bingo with Catholic Church. There's, but but Don was right. That, you know, we should have a casino here. Yeah. And and there are problems. Yeah. But there's no manpower. There's nobody out there that will, well, will you know, take over and well, it's just like and, this. And, and control this. Right. You know, like there's the, just nobody there anymore. Yeah. You know, it's just like this Rivers Casino. Right. I said, how come you don't have bus service? Oh, we have a bus from the. Uh, blue line to the casino but there's a bunch of people who can't get on public transportation so they go over here to uh, Harlem and Foster and they got a bus there that takes them to uh, Indiana 
Yeah. yeah. What was the rationale in the first place for allowing casinos on water? On water only. That was a joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that yeah, was yeah. a joke. Yeah. You, you could. Toad and then they, you had to get off every two hours or yeah. three hours. <laughs> they had a limit of how much money you could lose, which was okay. ridiculous. <laughs> and and then they sh finally changed all that stuff. What if yeah. I said, what if there's waves on the roof? <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, right. you go out. You know, no, we wouldn't That's go out. Crazy. I said, Thank you very much. Well, yeah, I was on a one of those That's boats crazy, in Mississippi yeah. going out of Colina, Colina or one of those. Yeah. Of that area, anyway, and uh, well, we went around, and after we choked on the smoke, we decided to go out the t tail there and watch the uh, wheel go around because we couldn't take the smoke anymore. Oh. <laughs> and we had our thirty dollars, we blew that, and that was the end of it. <laughs> what if you're with the ship drifts across into the next state, then too, you know, yeah. wrong side of the river? Well, I'm thinking a, now of to what extent, if any, did Al Capone control or influence the mob or the syndicate or the outfit after his imprisonment. There was a nifty little note in yesterday's trip about the killing of Edward O'Hare in the late 30s that yeah. they thought was Capone's revenge for he being off largely with a wire helping to convict o, uh, Capone of tax evasion. What was his, uh, was he a lawyer? Or? Well, he was the father, as it turns out, of Butch yeah, O'Hare. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I forget his role. Sportsman's Park. He, 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 yeah, he, that's right. Sportsman. He was the president of Sportsman's he, Park. He, and he they think that by the late 30s, okay. Capone was able to engineer the killing of him, of yeah. assassination in an automobile yeah. Yeah. type well, chase. Well, that was his story, was how come they named O'Hare Field after Butch O'Hare, because he never he really had warrior. residence in Chicago. Yeah. He was a warrior. He shot down five. Yeah, was other. Yeah. He was a real hero from yeah. up there. Yeah, no, but there was no, other ones that were just as good as he no, were. There, there is a, there's a reason behind it. Yeah. Re the reason it's named for Butch O'Hare is that there was a move to change the name from Orchard Field, the original was Orchard Field, mm -hmm. in honor of General George C. Marshall, who was the chief of staff of the U.S. Army during World War II. It was very well known. Before Eisenhower had be, it was before D-Day, before Eisenhower became the great and, and, you know, more or less eclipsed, and before MacArthur had returned. So all the news was focused on Marshall, and there was a move to change the name in honor of George C. Marshall. That would have meant that the name of the airfield would have been Marshall, Marshall Field. field. Oh, and right. Colonel Robert McCormick <laughs> blew a gas <laughs> at the idea that his rival, his That's great rival, the owner of the, sh the then Chicago the Sun, <laughs> was going to have a field name, was going to have an airfield name. So he started in the Tribune, he, he, I more said, find us a war hero, <laughs> Butch O'Hare. So he started a groundswell to name it, oh. and actually the idea of an actual combat hero as opposed to a general in Washington, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that carried the day. Yeah, but right. that was because Colonel McCormick was not about to have the premier air, <laughs> airfield named Marshall yeah, Field. Well, it's just good like point. Billy Mitchell Field up in Milwaukee, I don't yeah. know. But the, but he wasn't a rival to Colonel McCormick. See, that was the idea. McCormick and the Fields were bitter. You know, they were bitter enemies because McCormick was a oh, yeah. kind of an isolationist Republican, where Marshall Field was a was a pro New Deal Democrat, and so there was there was no love lost between the two of them. Yeah, it yeah makes sense. I, I was going to say. Edward O'Hare was from St. Louis. They don't even know if Butch O'Hare ever visited Chicago. Right. Maybe on I mean, didn't make any difference yeah. to the colonel. He just didn't want it to be Marshall <laughs> yeah. Field. He didn't right, want right, it, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> and and uh, O'Hare, Edward O'Hare, was running a dog track, and he worked for the guy that invented the um, uh, automatic uh, uh, rabbit, you know, here comes Bunky, you know. <laughs> And when the guy passed away, O'Hare got the control of it. And when when um, Capone wanted him to come to Chicago to run the dog track, and you said, where was it, Sportsman's Park? Yeah, or? Sportsman's Park. Yeah. Uh, and then he did come, and he did run, but he kept his own books. Mm, he and kept his own books. Yeah, <laughs> so he wasn't killed until 1936 or so. But right. in the meantime, his deal was... Uh, to the to the feds, uh, I I want my son to go to an academy, <laughs> you know, either West Point or Annapolis, ah, et cetera, okay. and that's how okay. how he got there. Yeah, <laughs> they they chased him down Ogden Avenue and they killed him. And, right. and that yeah. when 
when O'Hare got killed. That was at the beginning of the war. Right? It was around 36 or so. It was. No, not, I, mean, I, I mean, think the war just began in Europe. Oh, you mean the sun? Yeah. 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 Down, yeah. Sir, yeah, right after the war started. Yeah. Yeah. And we needed uh, yeah. an arrow or something. You know, you know what, by the way, they never found out what happened to him. It, it, he just yeah, disappeared. Just disappeared. Right? Yeah, it might have been friendly fire. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, boy. That wouldn't be the first one. Yeah. No, it wouldn't be. I, I could see another problem if they, if they had called it Marshall Field. With the Macy's today, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you think that would have changed, too? Totally? <laughs> no, they would have, they would have uh, landmarked it. Yeah. I mean, I'm no businessman, but to give away the name Marshall Fields in Chicago for Macy's? Never, just, never, just, never made sense. Marshall to Field, a Macy company under it or something? Yeah, like right. Yeah. Well, the, the, the story I heard was they were going to come in here, and they told Macy, they said, I wouldn't change the name because the fact is you're going to have a big repercussion on that. Mm -hmm. And they lost at least two managers because of the name change. And even though they landmarked the name, uh, the people were upset about it. And that was a real big lull in business for a long time. And I don't know if they still ever recovered. I think well, they did. Back. Well, they, they, yeah. They've relented a little bit. I noticed at Christmas time, uh, they had the Frango Mints in a classic Marshall Fields yeah. box. You could buy them with the Marshall Fields logo and everything on it. Their window display honored the, 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 the Marshall Field tradition. The, the name Marshall Field appeared in, in the various window displays yeah, that they did yeah. for Christmas. I didn't get a chance to go so I think they're recognizing that they, ha they have to yeah. play on that Marshall Field name. That they're, yeah. they're, they're not as, as reluctant to use it as they were the first yeah, well, one. They, 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 they realized well, how much animosity, I think, it yeah, they, they, How uh, much it meant to Chicago. They yeah, said it would yeah. cost them too much to change the ads on the newspaper. Yeah, but they but, wanted uh, nationwide advertising. Yeah, yeah right. but uh, Carson's, they have uh, Bonta owns them and they they change hmm. the city that they're in well I agree I think I think they should have kept the name I think yeah. Yeah. Made well it. you know you know the plaques on the building still say Marshall yeah. the Field. city insisted on that that yeah, was because the city that's landmark and you yeah. can't change landmark right. yeah okay. I'll tell you I went I was down in the store and uh, you know twice actually the before and after Christmas it is still still <laughs> something it, it, it's a, it's an exciting thing oh, to yeah. go to Marshall Field it yes, really it is, is. Oh, the walnut uh, room has still Yeah, yeah I brought go. people in there, and they just, it's, uh, you know, this is like Miracle on 34th <laughs> Street, you know, and, and they just, you know, they understand it and all that, but but it, it's it's nice to have it there. It well, that's really why is. I was I was so I was so gratified this year to see that, that to see that Marshall Field name being honored again. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I think they've gotten the message that yeah. Chicago still loves that still name, loves of Marshall that name. Field. Yeah. yeah. Well, Chicago you, hangs on to all their Comiskey yeah. Park and. Sure. Wrigley Field mm -hmm. and, you know. U.S. Cellular Field? Yeah. yeah. No. Cellular Field. The cellular Field. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but cellular I, I had a cousin at uh, one of the stores. was a different department store, and they, Macy's bought them, and they changed it over. And she said, I didn't realize how much animosity Chicago had against Macy for trying to change the name of Marshall Field. Hmm. She said all the other ones just accepted it. And, uh, yeah. No, that's a tradition. Chicago, that's that's traditional. traditional. Yeah. 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 Well, Marshall Field sold a long time ago, though. How many? So 30, 40 years ago, these, there was several different stores. Oh, the fields, they they kept oh, yeah, the they fields have been out of it for a yeah, long time. Right. Yeah. 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 It was yeah. Field Dayton, Hudson, Hudson, and Target yeah. had it yeah. for yeah. a long time. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say Dayton, Hudson. And but they, kept, yeah. they, were wise, they were wise enough to keep uh, the Marshall Field yeah. name. There was a museum. company called Bottas from England. They owned it for a while. They never understood what it was all about, you know. <laughs> you got to come from. You can't come from the outside and and, and run a store like that. It's got to come from within. Sometimes it takes the uh, the guy, the pencil pusher, that takes care of the books. Yeah. And he'll tell them if they're making money or losing yeah. money, yeah. and you know we better we better get back to the Chicago's basics. Chicago is notorious for that one in change because of the fact that the uh, several other businesses tried to crop into here and they. It was very difficult, and I'm not sure it was because of the people or because of the bureaucracy, but uh, a lot of stores never really survived here. I'd say it was the people, like a, kind of a spontaneous thing. Yeah. Myself. I think so. Well, the other thing I thought was funny was Walmart tried to open a store in Germany, and they failed. Hmm. Uh, failed? Really? Yeah. Walmart. <laughs> Vol <laughs> like Vol it. Vol Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> Right, it's, does it mean something? Walmart means something in German? We don't know. No, not really. <laughs> they just didn't like, they like the mom and pa shops for the most part, although there's a lot of big businesses around, but in general, they, they are very 
Uh, it's just like they still have the small merchant. They yeah. Still, yeah. You, yeah. You go to Chinatown, and the same thing there. You go. They go out twice a day to, right. for food. Right. You know, and the, and the Polish go out once a day for food. That yeah. type of thing. Yeah. yeah. By the way, it's funny go, going to Chris Kindle Mart this year. So I get off the car, and, and uh, I, first thing, first. Uh, Stall I see there is Dinkle's Bakery, which is from <laughs> Lincoln <laughs> Avenue yeah. in uh, Lakeview. You know, he said, "Oh yeah, that, that's authentic German." You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah the only German remnant in that neighborhood. Yeah, now. right. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. there's only yeah. a few German bakeries around anymore. Dinkle's yeah. and uh, Reuters over on uh, Grand Avenue. That's well, right. Weber's and Archer. That's actually a German. Yeah, yeah. Weber's. Yeah. What's yeah. mean Weber means yeah. Weaver in English. Dispatch. <laughs> sort of, sort of. They just can't make it when you got the. The bakeries in the big stores, right? Heinemann's, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 yeah Jewel, you know, and they have a good product, you know. They, yeah. This Mariano's is going over big now. Oh, that's oh, yeah. very yeah. big. big, big. Yeah. 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 In fact, they're, they're talking yeah. about uh, you know this guy by the name of Mariano used to work for Dominic, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. And and they got rid of him. Yep. Well, whatever happened there, and he says, "I'm going to put you out of business." He may do and it. he's he may right do it. on yeah. track. Yeah, yeah. 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 There's, a, there's, a si there's a similar story to uh, Home Depot. Uh, Home Depot oh. wanted to uh, sell Craftsman tools. Mm -hmm. Craftsman sell tools. Sears. 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 So they went Sears. out and bought their own brand in there. And at the same time, basically, uh, Rigid Tools came in because Rigid used to make uh, tools for Sears. And Sears decided to go to Japan, and Rigid kept had all the dyes and everything else, so they started making Rigid tools. So they had essentially Sears tools with the Rigid name on there because they were originally, go and they're selling them quite well in uh, Home Depot. Are they still? Yeah. I wonder what Al Capone would have thought of this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Going back to the syndicate just <laughs> after I, <laughs> where, where did we go? Did we say, yeah, where outfit? did we go wrong? What do we like the better, the outfit, the mob, or the syndicate? Maybe outfit. Outfit. But just after uh, Al was imprisoned, uh, John Cass put out a very interesting article in the Tribune about ten days ago that he basically and Alderman Ed Burke, city council historian, really feel that Cermak was the intended target of the assassination yeah. attempt against By Zingara. which uh, most people assume it was yeah, FDR. Yeah. I think often you hear the assumption without challenge that FDR was the target. Now you're having more and more revisionists well, coming out that might have been Cermak. There was uh, three there was three possibilities. One, that tar that Cermak was the target, that Roosevelt was the target and they missed hit uh Cermak. Or were they both the target? Yeah. But the, uh, the cliche on that was the fact uh, above Cermak's tomb, it says, I wish, I'm glad it was me. It was me. Yeah. 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 And Cermak hated Roosevelt, so consequently yeah. he would never have said that. We think yeah, that was were, made up by some newspaper man, just like saying yeah. so Joe and all that other stuff. Yeah. They said yeah. it was a dying breath. but Well, of course, in that the, the, the great two-part episode of The Untouchables, which as a kid, that was the only the time. Assassin. That was the only time that I was allowed, because that was past my bedtime when The Untouchables came on. The only time I was allowed to watch The Untouchables stay up late was when they did that two-part episode, mm. because it was about history. Already then I was interested in history. It was about FDR and mayor but that was the the thrust of that was the whole first episode is about the syndicate's intention to kill Cermak and how uh, at the very last minute Elliot Ness you know nails the guy with the high powered rifle yeah. who intended to kill mayor Cermak yeah, yeah, okay. and then as he's as he's you know he pushes his hat back on his head and he's relieved mm -hmm. and then suddenly the the shots are fired by yeah. Zangara which winds up killing uh yeah. killing mayor Cermak but the whole thrust of that episode was that the that the syndicate had this intention of killing Mayor Cermak, yeah. but they failed, mm -hmm. and then he dies erroneously. I remember, uh, John. I remember there was one so. scene with uh, with uh, I'll be in a minute, uh, one half a second a minute. Uh, Bruce Gordon, who we met at these different movie shows, our family did, but some other guys from there too. Great but he Frank says, uh, he says, yeah, and then there's gonna be one dead Bulgarian, and he shoots at a picture of Cermak on the bulletin <laughs> board. One dead Bulgarian. Oh yeah, yeah. Bulgarian. And then the fellow, the fellow that played Mel Cooley, is in there and says he's Bohemian, Frank. Who's Mel Cooley? <laughs> on, on the Dick Van Dyke show, Richard Deacon. Richard Deacon was one of his. Oh, one of his he? he was one of his counsel there. Oh, suits probably. And, yeah. and when uh, when when Bruce Gordon says finito to that Bulgarian, <laughs> and and uh, yeah. uh, he says 
bohemian Frank. Sir Mac is a bohemian. <laughs> and then <laughs> what did he, difference? Does then Diddy says Iceberg, Greenberg, Goldberg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I can't imagine why the the mob would want to knock off Sir Mac. Truthfully. Oh, excuse me, Ken. He's the wrong mob. Again, no. it's time for a brief timeout. You're listening to Meet the Chicago Historians, and we thank you for it. Are you looking for a good place to have lunch or dinner? Well, I have just the right place for you to go. And that's Sorrento's Village Restaurant and Pizzeria located at 2318 North Mannheim Road in Melrose Park. Now, every Friday from 5 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., you can enjoy their all-you-can-eat buffet and pasta bar, a perfect way for families and friends to enjoy a delicious, fresh meal together for just $11.95 for adults and $7.95 for children, 10 years and under. Sorrento's is proud to introduce its Friday night buffet with pasta bar made to order. Fresh pasta with your choice of vodka, four trees alfredo, or a marinara sauce, plus Sorrento's meatballs and sausage, and a buffet that is burning with favorites from risotto, seafood, and chicken dishes, and a variety of Sorrento's pizzas and full salad bar, and garlic bread. Again, just $11.95 for adults and $7.95 for children, 10 years and under. All you can eat. Also, you can enjoy their affordable, fast, perfect, full-service catering. Catering might sound expensive, but when you choose Sorrento's, we do the work, and you take the applause for a memorable party for every occasion. Or you use one of our beautiful banquet rooms, accommodating 20 to 200 guests. Many catering orders can be prepared the same day or within 24 hours. No other weekday lunch buffet like it. Sorrento's weekday, Monday to Friday, Lunch buffet is perfect for business, get-togethers, even funeral luncheons. Soup, salad, pasta, pizza, vegetables, freshly baked bread, meat, and or fish, plus dessert. Call 847-455-9440 for group prices. On Tuesday, purchase a regular price soft drink and enjoy the fabulous buffet at half off from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Remember, for the best food in town, go to Sorrento's Village Restaurant and Pizzeria. Located at 2318 North Mannheim Road in Melrose Park, just south of Fullerton Avenue on the west side of the street, and plenty of free parking. You can call Frank or Sam at 847-455-9440. That's Sorrento's Village Restaurant, located at 2318 North Mannheim Road in Melrose Park. Call 847-455-9440. That's 847-455-9480 for the best food in town. And now back to our historians. Well, we're not in the home stretch yet. But we're around the far turn, gang. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do say gang loosely here. Yeah. <laughs> in another sense, of course. Uh, we were talking about uh, commerce before. We somehow got a little sidetracked. But did anyone ever hear that one of those famous chain of uh, little mom pot, what they call mom pot stores today, either like Ro- Royal Blue or Midwest or something, was owned by Capone? Anyone ever hear anything like that? No. Somebody uh-huh. told me he owned some... Something like that. Yeah, no. Ever hear that? No. Didn't he own a bakery? Oh. Seems to me. Cervac? Mm-hmm. No, no, it's not. No, Capone. 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 Yeah. Capone. Um, not that I'm aware of. I mean, not that. Uh, he yeah, probably yeah, has figures in bakeries, yeah. but not. Uh, you know, the other thing, too, is that when, you know, Prohibition was still going, and that was, you know, booze was still his primary, you know, Source of income. What did they say one year? He, he earned something like three hundred million dollars or something like that. You know. Imagine what that. Imagine what that would mean in oh. the twenties compared to, to money to oh, yeah. it's like billions. Today. And some like like that. Nemir Pearsoff is a big head. And he says, "And last year we made a hundred million dollars after taxes. <laughs> oh, you have pay no taxes." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he yeah. made a great Jake Greasy Thumb Guzik. Guzik. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Nehemiah Pearsoff, great character. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you know the other thing I was thinking too. You were talking about mobs. Capone with the St. Valentine's Massacre is always considered to be, you know, a murder, all that. But 
that you have a a, a, a a fellow like Dillinger who was favored by the public. You know, the the public sort of went for romantic criminal. Romant yeah, exactly. You know, he was robbing the bank. He was robbing the the rich to pay right. for, for the, the poor. poor. Next to the yeah. banks were. Poor people's favorite place, then. Yeah, <laughs> but you, you notice the difference there between, uh, you know, the 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 public uh, perception. You know, Dillinger was sort of a hero, really. To you, a had, lot you had of others. People. You had Pretty Boy Floyd at that yeah. time. Yeah. You had the Ma Barker, the Barker Gang. Yeah. Babyface Nelson, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Bonnie, yeah. Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie, Bonnie and Clyde. They were big heroes. Yeah. We rob banks. Yeah. <laughs> well, Dillinger was sort of funny in the movie where he showed robbing the bank and he had the hostages. And one woman says, I, can you drop me off here? I live here. <laughs> and he dropped her off. <laughs> yeah, he had, he had the people jump on the running board or something, didn't he? So yeah. they, they couldn't well, fire him. One of history channel, or one of those channels, I'm sorry, uh, there was some actual film when he was, was, he was captured. I think it was sometime in Indiana. You know, like talking to him like he's, a, he's a, some kind of a star, you know. Yeah, for right. sure. Talking to them the same way back and forth. Yeah. Well, they said he lived in, in the house and he used to go, like, work every morning. <laughs> Come home. Sometimes he came home at night. <laughs> like a lot of the criminals, you know, they didn't get hit before they got there, but it's just like a job. They, <laughs> How was your work day, honey? Yeah, yeah. right, yeah. <laughs> I love the story about Alvin Karpis, of course, who had, had claimed that uh, that if J. Edgar Hoover showed his face in his town, he would, he would kill Hoover. And I think Karpis was public enemy number one. And when the FBI finally located him and they wired the news to Washington, Hoover said, wait. And Hoover <laughs> flew out. And Hoover then personally, uh, the story is, Car Carpus came out of his apartment, he got into his car, and Hoover walked up to the side and said, Carpus, I'm J. Edgar Hoover. You're <laughs> under arrest. It was the only time in his career that Hoover personally made an arrest. Yeah. I understand it was a setup, though. They, yeah, they, 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 they were surrounded by FBI. Yeah, he, he wasn't was going there all by himself. Well, there was a camera there, I bet. But, but, yeah, he, there was there, a camera, yeah. but he But, yeah. he, but, he, but he, he did, and I mean, that was, was front camera. page news. That, oh, yeah. was, that yeah. was front page news. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The Leonardo DiCaprio movie made a good point of mentioning that scene. Did yeah, they? set up, yeah, a little publicity for J. Edgar. Well, you got to look at the when Dillinger got killed, they could never do that nowadays because... They were essentially shooting at him before, you know, he even... They didn't read him his Miranda rights. No. Yeah, there you go. I mean, do the Miranda rights. Listen, yeah. Carmen, I'm warning you. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, yeah, read and read. They, they, were, yeah. they, were, they were... Don't pull that from. gun out until yeah, I read this... Well, what about uh, and, what, and what movie, what movie that that? was playing at the Biograph Theater? Manhattan, Manhattan Melodrama. 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 Who's, who's the star of Manhattan Melodrama? Clark, Clark Abel, Abel and William, William Powell, Powell Ryan Ryan Lloyd, and Myrna Lai. A young Mickey Rooney, Leo Carrillo, <laughs> Swart the Wonder Clam. <laughs> and Trigger and his wonder dog, Bullet. <laughs> right. <laughs> Did some try to claim that that wasn't really Dillinger who was killed and yeah, lying on the slam? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, you bring that, that up. Yeah, that's right. really yeah, just great. bring that up. That's uh, all conspiracy <laughs> theories that have come yeah. all the time. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know, it's just like... Uh, he didn't have a scar on his... Kennedy yeah. got shot, and there was a mob hit, and all yeah. this type oh, of stuff. from the police because that Hitler still alive, seen in Argentina or somewhere. Yeah. Now the, <laughs> must be the oldest guy in the world. Now the, the, the Biograph Theater, I think, still exists. I think oh yeah, it's yeah. a live theater. Isn't, it, isn't oh, no. it true that every year on the anniversary, do they still? Sh they used to have a showing of Manhattan melodrama on the anniversary. I don't think they've done that. I don't well. know if they. No. Yeah, I remember yeah, seeing that in the newspaper where they well, they would well, show they would show that on the anniversary of Dylan Hughes. One thing, one thing, John, they've never changed the. Uh, facade, the so he still has the marquee. Yeah. It's got those twinkle lights on cool there. By refrigeration, yeah, cool, yeah, cold cool by refrigeration. Yeah. yeah. You know, we were talking uh, before. Uh, I think we were off the air, but uh, about the way people were described and that, and I just happened to run across this thousand-dollar reward poster for Frank Nitto. Frank Nitti, oh, yeah. and they say that uh, he had dark hair, and what was his complexion? Swarthy. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Good yeah. name you yeah. have. Yeah. That's a legitimate word, though, isn't it? And it yeah. says he's Italian and usually well dressed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Three piece suit. Oh, What's funny about the uh, movie, though, with uh, with, with uh, Bubba Gunnery with Dillinger, was the fact that they used a patty, uh, porch theater. As the interior of the biograph. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, I didn't the, know that. So the biograph no longer looks like an oh, interior. Oh, it's changed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I use the Porsche. Oh, Forbes Theater. Yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> Porsche, the, Porsche, the Porsche appreciated because they got all new seats and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we'll let you use the interior. <laughs> well, here's we we're talking about uh, about uh, the the uh, thread on on President Lincoln or President Lincoln, President <laughs> Roosevelt's uh, uh, life. And uh, there's a story in here about uh, Cermak shot in the abdomen at uh, Bayfront Park in Miami, and uh, he died three weeks later. Me many believe that Zangara was not aiming at FDR, but at Cermak, and was sent by the Chicago mob as retaliation for the shooting of Cermak, for the shooting of Nitto. Huh. So uh, that could very well be, uh, uh, you know, Ed Kelly is... Uh, Succeeded Sir Mac as Chicago mayor, yeah. and uh, but Frank a little byproduct on that Kelly is when Nash. we went back to getting our extra day off. Yeah, it's named for they, Kelly. They well, it's yeah, a Kelly, Kelly gave us the Kelly day off. Yeah, and then it was forgotten about because we lost it, and when we got it back, uh, it was named the Daily Day. Yeah, and that was not taken very well. I didn't know that we <laughs> lost it. They what? wanted it to go back to the Kelly Day. Uh, Bill didn't, didn't. They never lost it, did they? What? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah oh. For a while there. Oh, By the way, oh. Frank Nitty killed himself, and that was like in 1943. Right. He was out. Yards, yeah. right. Well, it was out. I don't know. Cermak Road along oh. the railroad tracks Not west of me, you know, where we live. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, it was, I don't know, west of Berwyn or whatever yeah, is yeah, out there. Well, well, in one movie, he's through another window. In, in uh, Untouchables TV, he, he gets killed in a subway when there was no subway. <laughs> yeah, you know, so. yeah. Well, I, he shouldn't have been there then. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I ask myself all the time, if the mob wanted to hit Cermak, why would they... Wait till he's down there? Why do they wait until he's in the president so the president elected he'll involve all the feds? I mean, why would they just kill him? And Sangara was a radical. He's always described he as an anarchist. He tried to kill the king of Italy. Yeah. So like it's, an anarchist, it's plausible yeah. that he would be shooting at the president of the United States and not at some city politician from Chicago. Yeah. 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 Cermak was probably fatter and a better target. Better target. <laughs> And and the other thing is, then Gare is, is executed two weeks later. Yes. So. Yes. Gee, yeah. well, I, I, it, you know, if it happened today, he'd still be on appeal. You know, yeah, yeah. back in 1932. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was in a couple of months he was uh, executed, right? Yeah, yeah it, was it was like 14 customary. days. Was the uh, the assassin a of uh, President McKinley was executed within just a month and a half. It was a very short period right between the time of McKinley's assassination yeah. and the execution of, of Leon Cholgosh. Ch Cholgosh, oh, yeah. yeah. Never know how to pronounce it. It's almost unpronounceable. Cholgosh. Well, don't, don't worry but, about it. But in any event, <laughs> it, it, you know, justice was swift in those days. Yeah. And you didn't have yeah. endless appeals to endless courts, you know. You, you know, you're talking about the saboteurs, etc. They were tried at 11 o'clock in the morning. At Mil 1 o'clock in the afternoon, they were all That's shot right. in Military very, tribunals. Yeah. Military yeah. justice. They weren't, yeah. tried, they weren't tried in federal court. They were tried by military yeah. tribunals. Yeah, and they, they uh, I don't know, they, they buried them in an unmarked grave. They don't know where the hell they're at, right. you know, so. Well, what do you say? Somebody will dig them up. Yeah. Mm. Well, you know, years ago, they didn't keep good records, yeah. uh, and, and there's a lot of stuff. I, I have, one of my sons is a geophysicist, and he was on a project a few years back where he was uh, surveying the old prisoner of war camps in the Chicago area. And there were about a dozen of them in the Chicago area. Civil War? No. Or uh, World, World War II? World War II. Oh, World War II. German mm -hmm. prisoner of war camps. And most of them were, were in park areas or publicly owned land. And uh, the, they, were, they buried a lot of stuff. I know I'm not talking bodies, but they buried a lot of stuff they shouldn't have buried. Uh, back then, so he was part of a crew that was doing a survey to find drums and waste material and stuff that might be uh, uh, pollutants uh, before they would open up these areas back to the public again. But he told me there was about a dozen prisoner of war camps in the Chicago area. Mm. Yeah. I wonder if there were any in Chicago itself. Yeah. Yes, there were. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I'd have, to, I'd I have to talk to him. But in the city? Yeah. 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 They would yeah. drive down Cicero Avenue, trucks of them. They'd be waving all the girls, and hmm. the girls would be waving back. Well, a lot of them escaped, yeah. and they disappeared to the... the uh, economy as such, and they never did really find them. Well, uh, but, you know, they gave them passes, I heard. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? Um, after World War II, well, Fort Sheridan, well, which is not Chicago, but it's definitely adjacent mm -hmm. to, they had prisoners of war there for at least three years after the war, but they didn't want to send... After uh, the war? 
they didn't want to send a couple of hundred thousand Germans all back hmm. to Germany at one time. Hmm. So they kept them there. And Did many Germans want to stay, Ken, do you think? And well, no, they wanted to go back. Okay. There, there, are family, that, there are a few that stayed. But uh, they, they, hmm. they, um, they never had one go AWOL. And they, they, they somehow were able to, you know, get on the uh, North Shore and come down yeah. and spend time, and you know, <laughs> and just, so you the reason I, I know that one a kinder, one, gentler world. Yeah, one, wow. one of my brother's, uh, uh, you know, classmates uh, was uh, uh, in charge of a uh, kitchen there, huh. and uh, so he, uh, he said, you know, they, there, there were a couple that escaped down in the in the western, you know, Montana or something like that, but most of them. Those diehards. Yeah, they didn't want to. They they didn't want to uh, jeopardize their their. Uh, the uh, war is over. Yeah, right. They they wanted to go back home. You know. I know my 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 wife's sister. Her this would be her father-in-law. He was talking about in World War Two time. He was. Uh, he's always calling me now. But he was uh, assigned. There was prisoner work camps uh, in Michigan, and they were allowed to like help with the harvest of apples or whatever. Yeah. Or, I guess they were given something. These guys came and they could, one at a time, they'd go across the road and sit at the bar and have a few beers. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, they came settled in Michigan after the war. They, you know, they, they loved that. So. Yeah, no, uh, they, 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 and by the way, I did read that every state in the Union had a uh, some sort of a prisoner of war camp. And I know I was out at Fort Lewis in the state of Washington, and they had a, a stockade out there that was like Stalag 17. It was, <laughs> it was identical, you know, very similar with the... Uh, barracks and uh, tower guards and all that. In case I had to do that occasionally. I was an MP out there. Yes. Is, so. is there a story about any Italian prisoners of war? Because there you had, uh, they went from an Axis to an ally after Mussolini was overthrown. Yeah. How yeah. any right. Italian prisoners might have been dealt with? I don't know where we had them all. Italian we sent them all to Taylor Street. A lot of Germans were not happy with Hitler, and they were all conscripts anyway, so uh, many of them were not really antagonistic as such, but uh, basically, uh, I, I bet the Italians never came over here, Rich. I just got the feeling. Yeah, you never heard of Italian, you never heard Japanese of prisoner of war camps here. No, in the no, 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 that's a good point. Yeah, but you, never, you never hear of <laughs> Japanese military POW camps right. in the no, states. No, no, you know why? They have existed, but I've never heard of them. They, they, uh, they never yeah. surrendered. That's why. Yeah. They, well, that's that's yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, they, 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 that was a. That, Peter that, was, enough, uh, that was loss of face if they kept it. Yeah, that's exactly. True. Peter they, they Ustinoff, died to the last uh, man. Peter Ustinoff told a story about something <laughs> yeah. about some movie in Europe, and some guy comes up to him, very German, and he goes, uh, You're making a movie about the war, huh? <laughs> <laughs> he had all kinds of uniforms and whatever stashed, you know, from the actual German army. And he says, Well, what, what is this? What's this all? He says, well, we do when the war was over. The Americans wanted to make, make movies about how brave they were, so he's got all the, supplying them with that stuff. <laughs> well, he looked over, shifty, looking around. And, uh, yeah, I know there were, there were a lot of Russian prisoners that did not want to go back yeah. to, to the Soviet Union after. Oh yeah, oh, they yeah. were for they had to, they had, and most of them were executed. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say Stalin's idea was anybody who had been in the sure. West was no longer reliable would have would, yeah. would, if they had seen what life is really like. Yeah. But they had to force these these uh, prisoners at gunpoint. They had to forcibly send yeah. them back to the. Well, they sent them back to Siberia, and most yeah. of them never. Yeah, yeah. No, or just right away just gunned them. Yeah, yeah. No. Oh. Operation Keyhole. I think it was. Oh, I know. I know when the Iron Curtain broke. I was in Germany, and uh, uh, they didn't have room for the returning soldiers. They had no housing in, in uh, Russia for them, so they had to stay. And they, they had a real strange way of building stuff. They used to say, well, I'll put the apartment building here. It would be in the middle of the street or off the corner or something. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> no zoning. Yeah, no zoning. And then all of them looked the same. Except one would be two stories and one would be six stories. And I got photographs at home about that. That's uh, strange. And then they had a statue. I forgot who it was, Stalin or something like that. And they uh, put it in a park. And, of course, the Poles didn't care for it too much. <laughs> so they I put... I wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> so they had stuff in front of it so they couldn't see it. <laughs> but Like, the, uh, like was, a Pones marker, yeah. you know. But, but when I was there last time, we were there, and they... They said the best thing the Russians did was leave. <laughs> and they put up a huge building in the center of Warsaw, Stalin. It was called the Palace of Culture. 
and it was Stalin's favorite type of architect architecture, which is usually called wedding cake architecture. Yeah. It's real fancy, everything all. It's a, a very, very ugly building. So the joke uh, in Warsaw was, where is the best view in all of Warsaw? The answer is from the top of the Palace of Culture. Why? Because from there, you can't yes. see the Palace <laughs> of Culture. Uh, well, it was my, my wife came from a town called Posen. Our family came from Posen. And they have one of those there, too. And uh, it's just in the middle of the street and a big, ugly thing, you know. And uh, they, I never heard anything more about it than oh, that. Where was that from? Uh, where? Posen. Where was that? In Poland. Poland. I know, I know that uh, Poland they refer to World War II as the, the war they lost twice, and you know you can see why. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. My God. Can you imagine being there in that nutcracker? Uh, oh. You, well, they they uh, said there that uh, the what the Nazis didn't do, the Russians the completed. Russians yeah. did. Yeah. 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 They, they tried. There was that Katyn Forest massacre oh, yeah. that they killed how many officers in the Poland? All the all they the. They blamed it on the Germans for years, but yeah. it was the. Uh, KGB boys like you know this guy Putin. Putin he was a he was ahead of that you know so now you know what do you yeah. figure? <laughs> well, you can't <laughs> trust him. No way. You oh. know the people there. When I was you there a couple of years ago, you talked to people under forty. And it was sort of laissez faire. They, you know, a little care, more carefree. People over forty over their shoulder all the time. See anybody was watching, talking to you. Mm -hmm. You know, but you went to the flea market there and it was pretty pretty nice. You know, yeah. you, you buy stuff there. And I got a pirated uh, Harley Davidson shirt for about twelve dollars. <laughs> of course, they made it there, you know. And they oh, could yeah. change your dollars to rubles or to euros, <laughs> no problem whatsoever. <laughs> you know, Putin, Putin was part of the Capone gang. That's that's why. <laughs> that's that's yeah, where he, he, he got his yeah. basic training. Yeah, yeah, right. You know. Yeah. Well, there is a restaurant on the river there that uh, what they love three mass sailing ships, and this was a. Uh, was never a sailing ship, but it was on the river, and it looked like a ship. But apparently, Putin gave it to the city of uh, uh, Capone. No, that yeah, was uh, <laughs> Saint Petersburg. <laughs> and, uh, Saint Petersburg is a nice, a relatively nice town. It's younger than Chicago, and the history of it was when uh, Peter the Great. Peter the Great Peter built the Great. it. He required them to bring in rocks every morning so they could build up the. Uh, the swamp area, because basically Chicago and uh, St. Petersburg were both swampy areas at one time. So that's maybe it, one time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they they uh, have a lot of canals in St. Petersburg, mm -hmm. and they, but they don't have movable bridges. They just got these solid bridges there I for the most part. They call it the Venice of the North. Yeah. yeah. Really? I thought that yeah. was Amsterdam. Yeah. No, no. St. Petersburg has been Spe called that. Speaking yeah. of water, our families had two cases of. Water back up recently, you know. Recently, recently. Yeah, w this winter, so. Oh. And, and they both require, uh, you know, dig ups and. Uh, well, the only thing I know is. about water in St. Petersburg is you don't drink it. <laughs> <laughs> Which was, of course, Leningrad for years from between uh, yeah, yeah, in the World War One and when just recently. Stalin and was, when, well, when they gave, and the people yeah. voted. The people voted, to, and the communists thought, sure, that because of the siege of Leningrad during World War yeah. One, they thought the communists thought that were they're going to keep. No, when the public was given a referendum on, they voted overwhelmingly no. to change the name change back to St. Petersburg. Well, it was Stalingrad for a while. No, Leningrad. Leningrad. I thought it was Stalingrad. Stalingrad, Stalingrad is, is now Volgograd. 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 Yeah. Volgograd. That's oh, yeah, his name. Yeah. But, which, which mean, uh, it was Stalingrad and Leningrad. Which is puzzling to me. Was St. Petersburg, Florida, was that Leningrad during that time? Too? I, don't think <laughs> so. I don't think so. <laughs> I would be very surprised. <laughs> Maybe we'll like to see a Putin grad. No, it was right. Goldbergville. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I do want to say before we close, and then on, on the gangland idea, I once introduced a, a friend of mine uh, who, who was of an age where, where it would be appropriate, and I said, you know, we were at a, at a uh, picnic, I said, you know, Nobody knows about Frank's military record. And he, and he had he said, Wow, what military record? I says, During Prohibition, Frank had been a tail gunner on a beer truck. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will be closing and wrapping up with about well, I guess we got about five minutes to go. Before we go anywhere, I want to thank our guest today, Jim Pater. Did I get it right that time? Pater, yeah. Pater. Okay. And you are a retired Chicago police lieutenant? Yes. What else? What'd you do oh, for real? Uh, what real else? Job? My real job? My, hey, 11 years in homicide. That's where I homicide. That's where I hang my hat, and that's what I'm proud of. Proud of Is it true that most homicides solve themselves? 
Hmm. No, no, you, you, you need us guys here to write the report. <laughs> <laughs> the paperwork. Could I ask but what's your pin? Is that a city is, of the veteran, veteran the police department? This is the Chicago Memorial, uh, Chicago, Chicago Police, police Memorial. Memorial Foundation. Oh. Mm -hmm. Chicago Police has probably the best police memorial in the, in the country, if not in the world, outside of the one in Washington, D.C. It's down on the east side of... Uh, uh, Soldier Field, and oh, uh, yeah. uh, I it's a seen beautiful. It. If you're ever down there, uh, getting <coughs> out of a thing, just head over to the east side and take a look at it. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful yeah, place. Yeah, little side bar on that is that. Uh, I think I announced it at one of the masses that uh, you know about a year ago we have a mass on Friday on uh, Father's Day, and uh, a couple of mopes tagged it, mm -hmm. tagged the oh. memorial, oh, and God. messed around with it, and that. Uh, Phil Klein had, uh, I can't think of his name now, Senator Kwame something, uh, introduce a, a bill in uh, Springfield, and, and it should come up pretty soon, uh, that the, the punishment for doing that for a police, fire, or military memorial, memorial uh, is raised very high. Good. Anybody no. that that does yep. it anymore, so uh, that should be coming up for a hearing pretty soon. Hopefully, it will pass. I think it will. And Phil Klein's a good guy too. I'm glad he's got that. Yeah. Been there. Yeah. And Don Herrien, you're here too, aren't you? Still. Right. Uh, Thirty-eight years with Chicago, eight years with Cook County, forty-six years all together. Woo! Uh, Forty of them were fighting organized crime, so I liked it, and it was something to do. And I got <laughs> it. Something to do. Yeah. Kept, kept you busy every something day. To yeah. Do, so. yeah, you had to write reports. Did you ever have any yeah. other jobs beforehand, or anything? Pardon? Did you ever other other jobs? Did you ever do be before the police department, or anything? Or? No, I was in the army for a couple of years in the Korean War. My first full time job, my only full time job, was the police department. That's it. Yeah. Oh my God! Never well, had a real you were a cadet. Were you a cadet? No. Oh. No, that was just starting when I was coming out of high school, and my I had an uncle on the job, and he mentioned to my mother what I'd be interested in. I said, what do I mean to do with the police department for, you know? A couple of years later, well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don, was your life ever in danger? Did you ever have a close shave? Oh, it was Not all right? fun. <laughs> oh, that's right. Okay. Uh, no. It sounds like you shot you first. Got, you got to read his book, Did though. It's quite good. Fire? You learn how to duck. And uh, how, you learn how to duck. How, how he Don, uses Don was also, uh, <laughs> yeah. Don was also a um, uh, part-timer at the racetrack and uh, with the Illinois Bureau of Racetrack Police and others. And also, a um, you'll see him in some movies. Yeah. He uh, backdraft. portrayed well backdraft and what else? U.S. Don? Marshal. Yeah, U.S. Marshal. Next of kin, raw deal. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Consultant the the now from U.S. Marshals. Some uh, untouchable series. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the new series, right? The one that was out a few years ago. And uh, there was a series of it. Yeah. 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 The nineties. Yeah, I guess it was. Yeah. Uh, I never watched that. William Forsythe, I think, played Capone oh, at that point. Yeah. He was just in town doing the mob doctor. Well, and they canceled it. Mob doctor. <laughs> yeah, it was a bad time. We were doing <laughs> some tough shows, and that, that was it. Our next taping will be. Oh, let's listen to this day. Here's a good day for you. Monday, April 15th. Does that ring a bell with anyone? Yeah, ding, 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 yeah. Ding, ding, ding. it does. Ding, ding, ding. And it wasn't yeah, the 18th of April either. Really. That was Paul Rivers' ride. And we're going to have to figure out some kind of a, a topic for that. Anybody have any ideas here? Nothing? Well, we covered Al Capone, kind of, today. With what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What a blanket. <laughs> what are we covering with? Yeah. He's buried? He shot Sir Mac and... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Come up with something. <laughs> well, we, I'm sure we will. We always do, don't we? Yes. We yes, always do. Yes, yes. And although we don't like to go, you can see we kind of play kind of loose. Don't like it too scripted. Because <laughs> yeah. oh, we Script? got our minds working. At all scripted, maybe. Descripted. Are we there? What do we got? All there? right, and now once again, here's the guy who started it all: our producer, chief electrical engineer, and all-round troubleshooter and good guy, John Devita. Hey, John, hold it. Can I say one more thing? Yeah. Remember, folks, history is much more than a book you keep on the shelf. <laughs> okay. And have a very happy. Easter. Come back next month.
Once again, you've been listening to our monthly program, Meet the Chicago Historians, which was pre recorded on March the 18th, 2013. Our historian show is broadcast over WRHS, Jack FM 89.7 Norwich, and WRW Smooth FM 88.1 Harwood Heights. We thank the managements of both stations for carrying our show. You can also access our show, both today's as well as a back library of older broadcasts, on the internet by going to WindyCityHometown.com. Goodbye, and once again, thanks for listening. This is Rich Lang speaking. You have been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians from the John Nevada Broadcast Center on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Monday, March the 18th, the year 2013. This program was produced and directed by John DeVita, edited by Stephen Lehman, and engineered by Tony Amato. This program was pre-recorded. Thanks for listening.